today is Tuesday, June 29th, to call this meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Town of Arlington, to order. Um, I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. John O'Rourke. I'm going to have to unmute him. I know that John is still commuting. Aaron Ford. Here. And Steve Radlack. Here. Wonderful. Uh, from the town of Arlington, um, Rick Fallarelli. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Uh, Vincent Lee? Here. Good evening. And I believe Kelly Lynam is on vacation this week. Um, but I think Jennifer Raitt may be joining us from the Director of Planning and Community Development. OK. Um, outside consultants, Paul Haverty? Good evening, Mr. Chair. Oh, good evening to you. And uh, from Beta Group, I believe um, Ms. Nova is away this week, but uh, Laura Krause, Bill McGrath, and Tyler DeRoyter, I think I saw all three of you. Yep. Good evening. Wonderful. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, appearing for 1165, uh, not 1165, RMSF, beg your pardon, for Thorndike Place. Uh, Stephanie Kiefer. Good evening. Good to see you. Uh, Gwen Noyce and Art Kliphaus are both here. here. Thank you. Um, and then are there, I believe there are others from your team here as well. Yes, we have Scott Thornton from Vanessa is here this, this evening. And uh, Bob, Bob Angler is here. And Scott uh, Vlasic is here. And we have a, a new person, Alan Zimlicki, who is joining us this evening. Wonderful. Welcome all. Um, we have two other cases this evening, but they, are, they were originally scheduled to start at 7.30. So um, I don't know if those folks are here. I do know that appearing on behalf of 10 Sunnyside Avenue, uh, Bob Inessi is here. I saw him earlier. But I don't believe the applicant for 55 Sutherland Road is on yet. Uh, we are here, actually, uh, for 55 oh, Sutherland. We are here. Oh, what yep. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, are we starting this one now? So you'll be starting at 7.30. Oh, 7.30. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law on June 16th, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may continue meeting remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to, may be able to see you your screen name or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. So for, for this meeting, uh, just to, I'm going to pretty much flip the order that we're going to be seeing, hearing things. So we'll start with Thorndike Place. 
um, and then we will move on to 55 Sutherland Road, then 10 Sunnyside Avenue, um, and then closing with the approval of minutes, um, just to try to move move people through as quickly as possible. So um, now turning to the comprehensive permit hearing for Thorndike Place, uh, some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. So at the prior hearing, the applicant discussed several aspects of their revised proposal, which referenced um, advice being provided by a consultant with experience in senior living developments. The board requested the applicant have the consultant attend this hearing of the board to address questions regarding how the operation of a senior living residence with services on this site would impact parking and traffic concerns expressed at the prior hearing. This will be the sole topic for discussion at this hearing with the exception of planning for future hearings. We will open with an introduction by the applicant followed by questions from the board and after the board members of the public will be invited to provide their questions and comments. So uh, Ms. Kiefer, if I could ask for a quick introduction and um, a quick introduction of the, our new member here. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the board. Um, at the last ZBA hearing, the applicant presented, um, it, just as a recap, the further information on the revised conceptual plans for the property to include the senior living um, building, um, as well as the six duplex units. Um, that included input from our civil engineer to review the updated stormwater report, um, updated architectural plans and elevations, updated traffic assessment, and then input from the uh, from the project's consulting geotech uh, expert uh, from McPhail. And then at the conclusion of that last hearing on June 10, um, the board charted out the future hearings this evening, um, primarily um, relating to the senior housing, sort of how that impacts the traffic parking. Um, and then a, a future hearing on the 13th. And so um, just to acknowledge that within the past two days, uh, the applicant has received copies of peer review reports um, prepared by Beta, um, one two days ago with respect to the civil and wetlands, and then the, uh, the second one received this morning regarding the updated traffic assessment that BAI had provided. And so um, our, our presentation this evening is, is really not um, to resolve that, but just to let the board know that prior to the next hearing, we anticipate having written responses submitted to the board in advance to the updated um, beta review. Um, for this evening, though, the, the project team were, were somewhat reduced in scope and we've, we've added somebody. So, um, uh, and to just kind of set the context and the framework for how we view the presentation this evening, I, I'm first going to just briefly ask Scott Thornton to um, just summarize um, where we were with the traffic and the parking and, and potentially just a, a, a quick reaction to the, the beta traffic peer review that we received. And then from there, it's really the, the heart of our presentation, if you will. Um, we're, we're pleased to present um, Alan Zinlicki this evening from ASZ Associates um, to provide the board with additional input on, on the planning considerations for senior living project and community. And as the board, as we've informed the board over the past couple of hearings on the revised program, um, the, the applicants have been in consultation with an established developer of senior housing regarding kind of the standard parameters, if you will, for, for a senior housing program. And, and as a part of and an outgrowth of those same discussions, the applicants have sought the input from Mr. Zimlicki, um, who has acted as the planning consultant to that senior living developer. And while the applicant remains in discussions with the developer, we have this evening the planning consultant, Mr. Zimlicki, to address kind of planning considerations for senior house. Um, I, I think as he will probably more eloquently state, he has a wealth of experience in senior housing, um, including affordable senior housing developments. And um, once Mr. Thornton gives his brief presentation. Um, I think I will allow Mr. Zimlicki to more formally introduce himself to the board. Um, but just by way of brief introduction, um, Alan is a, a former city planner by training. He had worked in the Cambridge City Planning Department for a number of years. Uh, he's worked for the Homeless Housing for Vets, and he has planned the development of a number of affordable elderly housing um, in the surrounding communities, including Concord, Boston, Cambridge, Malden, um, and he's been a longtime consultant to um, senior living developers. And uh, with that said, we recognize that the board um, may have some specific questions about the proposed senior housing community and its traffic, use of jitney service. Um, and we've asked Mr. Zimlicki to provide additional information to address those areas. And 
as the applicant has stated previously, the, the parameters of the senior um, living environment um, are to provide older residents with, a, with an ability to continue to live independently and to do so in a community setting where it's where it's attainable and achievable for, old, for our older citizens to live independently, such as having the ability um, to have a healthcare provider come on site to um, have assistance with scheduling appointments, to have someone coordinate social activities or, or physical exercise activities and um, provide pleasing spaces to gather with, with other residents or with family members and, and to have um, some dining options and, and as well as options for laundry and housekeeping. And so while the full list, it's, it's something that's largely, you know, beyond the board's role in a, in a comprehensive permit setting, um, we, we thought it might be informative, but it's also, um, these services are also gonna be more fully defined as the management development team somewhat advance the program. Um, but with that said, we hope that Mr. Zimlicki as well as Mr. Thornton can address the board's questions this evening in our limited presentation, um, you know, with the understanding that the range of services that are provided are, are typically developed once the project is approved and the management team is, is formally part of the project. But um, with that said, I'm going to turn things over to Scott Thornton and then from there we will have uh, Mr. Zimlicki. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kiefer. Um, Chairman Klein, members of the board, my name is Scott Thornton. I'm with VAI. Uh, we've been working on the traffic aspects, traffic and parking aspects for the project. And as Ms. Kiefer indicated, I'm just going to give a, a brief overview of, of where we stand with regard to some of the traffic and parking issues. Um, last, we had, we had provided a um, sort of an update of uh, traffic generation in a, in a June 8th letter um, and and talked about some of the uh, the differences in the in the project trip generation compared uh, as it had changed um, due to the to the makeup of the project and as Ms. Kiefer indicated we are in receipt of the of the beta of the latest beta comment letter regarding uh, traffic. Uh, we just received that today and we do plan to respond in writing to beta and the ZBA. Um, so that'll be a formal uh, formal response from us. Um, and we expect to get that out obviously before before the next hearing. Um, but just a few a few points. Um, you know, we, we noted and are, are happy to see that beta concurs with our findings that the proposed plan represents a, a reduction in vehicle trips when compared with the, the previous proposal. And, you know, uh, obviously the reduction, the, the change in makeup uh, from the, from the um, 176 unit development to the, to the duplex, uh, uh, project with the 124 uh, senior living units has a has a huge effect on the on the project trip generation and the vehicle trips and and lessens the impact of this project on uh, on town streets. Uh, we also note and agree with Beta's finding that the project parking supply is adequate for the development. Uh, based on information provided in the um, in the Institute of Traffic Engineers Parking Generation Manual, looking at at land use uh, land uses similar to what's proposed here, um, the, the the rates are um, in terms of demand rates, number of spaces per unit are higher than the um, than the rate the parking rate that's indicated in the Arlington zoning requirements. Um, but again, we, we feel, um, and, and the rates that, uh, that, our, that the project is providing are higher than, than both of those. Um, so we feel that, that uh, by providing the 96 parking spaces, we are going to be able to satisfy, satisfy the parking demand for the project for for all components of the development, which is which includes the residents and visitors and any staff that are that wind up working at the development. Um, 
There are other requests for information in Beta's letter, uh, which will be provided. Um, uh, one item involves the provision of a, of a dedicated transportation service or van for residents uh, to reduce reliance on personal vehicles. Uh, the applicant will commit to providing this service and it will be uh, dedicated, um, a dedicated service for uh, residents that can they can assist with trips to um, to shopping destinations to uh, public transit stations or or bus stops or medical appointments and so on uh, with the intent being that um, you know the the this this would be an amenity and it would be a service and it would be available for the residents so that they could feel like they don't need to to bring their, their personal vehicles to the site. Um, as I mentioned, we, we plan to respond to all these other comments uh, in writing. There's some, there's some requests for information related to site plans that, we'll, that we will uh, work with, um, uh, work with BSC on, on providing. But um, I think, you know, as I mentioned, we'll get that to the board before uh, before the July 13th hearing. And I think that's really the overview for, for traffic and parking. And um, I'll turn it over to Mr. Zimlicki and he can, he can go through his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, uh, Alan, if you could just unmute yourself. I don't know if you realize that you're muted. Um, I've got a very loud West Highland Terrier in the other room. That's why it's muted. Uh, um, well, it's uh, good to see all of you. Uh, I'm, I'm very new to the project, obviously, although I'm not new to Arthur and Gwen, the developers. Uh, we started working on assisted living in about 1990, I believe, and there, there were just a few of us working on it then. And uh, it's good to see that Gwen and Arthur have continued on with their interests because they've done a great job with what they've done so far. Um, as I said, I haven't been on board for very long. I have uh, done quite a few projects I've done uh, for my client, Volunteers of America. I worked on as a development consultant for Neshoba Park, uh, for Concord Park One, Concord Park Expansion, which we're in right now, uh, Forestdale Park in, in Malden. I've worked uh, with uh, uh, Central Boston Elder Services, which is the largest home care provider in the city of Boston to build a 57 unit um, supportive housing, a 100% supportive housing development in Dudley Square. Um, I've done a lot of nonprofit development stuff such as um, um, the project in Somerville for homeless veterans that was finished for Volunteers of America about three years ago. Uh, so uh, I have worked with the state funding agencies, the state housing agencies, the city of Cambridge uh, did a project on a 122 unit project on Franklin Street that we completed a couple of years ago, which is elderly housing, independent living with very limited supportive services, which has a lot of similarities to this project in that it's a, a big portion of it is affordable and it's a large project and it works out very well. Um, um, that's a quick um, outline of what I've done. I've done a lot of planning. I've worked at the Community Builders, which is a nationally known uh, housing, affordable housing development company. I worked there for six years and I've done a lot of uh, R&D office, and so on and so forth. So um, I looked, the first thing I saw after Gwen and Arthur sent me the materials on the project uh, was that the community was concerned with traffic and parking, which is, is not new. I mean, that's generally the major concern people have when we start doing one of these uh, developments. Uh, and um, in looking at it, um, I saw that um, uh, I decided I would download some information from other projects that I've worked on. And I called the engineer up and made him confirm, asked him to confirm the unit counts and the parking spaces. And he did that for me. Uh, and so I looked at Neshoba Park, Concord Park and Forestdale and um, Dudley, Central Boston Elder Services. I'm not gonna get into repeating um, uh, a lot of the numbers that the traffic people are gonna, the traffic engineers and transportation engineers are gonna provide you in writing and probably already have. But what I found was that um, without a doubt, 
this project has more parking than any one of the ones I just mentioned. Um, the Shoba Park has uh, like 0.5 parking spaces per unit, uh, per, per, uh, per unit, basically. Concord has a little more, Forestdale has a little less, and uh, Arlington, the Arlington project has 0.76, which is much better than the others, as you will find out when our engineers write this up. So I'm not gonna get into it in a lot of detail. So with that, I think uh, we have, uh, the developer has solved the parking issue, which people are concerned about. And I know that the next area of concern is the um, impact on the surrounding streets and impact on local neighborhood traffic. I took a quick look at that too, but have uh, pulled back a little bit. I looked at some of the market, some of the trip generation studies that we did in Malden for, um, uh, for the uh, Forestdale Park Assisted Living, which has been open for about a year and a half now. And uh, a lot of the same issues came up there uh, as they did for you folks, uh, as of course they would. I, I know Lake Street's been a major problem. And um, the, the beauty of this is this project is independent living, which means that it does without, uh, or, or it doesn't need a whole layer of people coming to the project that we would ordinarily have with assisted living. Uh, in memory care. We don't have a huge uh, dining room staff. We don't have a huge uh, kitchen, uh, kitchen staff. We don't have a lot of personal care attendants because that's an extra if people need it. We don't have a lot of housekeepers that clean every room every other day uh, and we can go through the list. So there's a, a huge differential in the number of staff coming to the project. And um, then we talked earlier uh, a few days ago and today about the uh, uh, the facility of having a, a van bring people back and forth to uh, Alewife Station, which is really wonderful. The station's so close, it's five, 10 minutes away. Uh, it's so easy to pick up uh, people that are coming to work in the development and so forth. And uh, it's also on the red line, which means that we have access to uh, uh, employees, prospective employees that are living in Boston and Cambridge and Somerville. Uh, in uh, South Boston, downtown, all the way into, into basically into um, uh, Roxbury. Uh, so there's a, uh, there's a, a need for uh, people to work in the facilities and take care of these facilities, as we all know. And this allows us to have access to a good, strong uh, work base and a possible employment structure. And my guess is, and what we've seen in other projects, if a train is available, if the transportation is available, people will use it and uh, they'll pay the fare, whatever it takes to come from South Boston or, or Roxbury or Dorchester into Alewife. It's a couple bucks, I forget what it is now. Uh, and, uh, and then if a van picks them up, there's, uh, there's a whole lot of parking that's not needed anymore. And it's a, a lot of relief on the uh, traffic counts coming in and out of the development uh, on all of the surrounding streets, including Lake. Also with this project, it's, um, it's independent living, which means that it's catering primarily to people that are at a point where they no, want, no longer wanna hang the drapes and take care of everything on a daily basis, but they're basically in pretty good, healthy shape. And a lot of them, at least the folks I know, uh, use the bicycle and I think the bicycle path is right there. So that's another major advantage of the project in terms of uh, traffic flow and uh, encouraging into the neighborhood. Um, what else can I, uh, uh, can I answer? Do you have other questions I can respond to? Anyway, I'll be working with the uh, development team as we go here to shape the staff and to shape uh, the way it's put together, the extent of the services that are gonna be offered. Um, as you can imagine, uh, uh, assisted living has taken a major hit with the pandemic and uh, a lot of people um, were um, hurt by the pandemic. They were in assisted living. And uh, this is not assisted living, it's independent living, uh, which is, which is uh, better from a marketing point of view because the people in assisted living or that would be putting their parents in assisted living are, are a little standoffish at this point, which is totally understandable. I think that market's coming back um, in probably the next few months once the uh, virus gets totally under control. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, independent living is a very, very good uh, use to go with uh, because the need is great. Um, there aren't many around. So with that, I will be quiet and uh, look for questions. Thank you. Um, 
the just a quick question the parking uh, ratio that you had given before was that inclusive of all parking on site or just resident parking all, all parking on site i believe that's what you're, ref what you're referring to that's so, correct right perfect yeah. thank you um and do you have so from your from your experience with with these other um developments so one of the concerns that was expressed earlier with this project where it was um you know just you know a fully multifamily structure was that you know a lot of people would be commuting uh, commuting hours late whoops yeah i missed the question already um I, was, um, I was curious if you had some sense as to when, you know, shifting now to a, you know, assisted living, uh, not, excuse me, not assisted living, but, um, you know, independent living, are the commuting hours of the employees different from, you know, standard nine to five positions? No, I think the commuting hours would be the same, uh, pretty much. Um, the uh, staff would come, well, it's not, as, it's, it's, the, the staff is so much lighter than it would be in assisted living. Um, in assisted, with assisted living, I mean, you need a staff to come in and serve the dining room in the morning. You need another staff or the same staff extended into the lunch period, which goes until about two o'clock. And then you need a, a fresh staff uh, to come in for dinner. And then with uh, uh, personal care attendants, basically they come in in the morning and get people ready and help them get up and you know help them get their clothes on and so on and so forth. Uh, so they have to be there fairly early and then um, they ease up at the end of the morning and then uh, less personal care attendants come on in the evening uh, because they're not needed. The rooms are clean, people are together, they've got their clothes on, they've had, some, they've had some meals. And then in the evening, it really drops down to a couple personal care people just to watch over things in case there's an emergency and they have to call in medical assistance or uh, someone has a personal emergency and needs some help. So that staff drops significantly. Obviously the uh, dining room staff with assisted living is uh, larger in the morning and the biggest in uh, uh, lunch, lunch time is the biggest meal ordinarily. Uh, that's when most elders want to eat. Um, and so they're very busy then with a lot of wait staff and that goes down a little bit for in the evening. And then of course they go away uh, in probably uh, uh, after dinner time. So the ones going away after dinner time are primarily dining room staff and cook staff and uh, the housekeeping, the cleaners, the personal care attendants, most of them have already gone. They've already done their job and they've left. Um, and uh, so the, the, uh, by the time the evening comes, there's very few employees on the building and it ramps up at around, you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. Okay, thank you. Um, questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. Um, the, uh, the, for just just a, as a matter of clarification, um, the van that will be <clears throat> that will be running for the residents um, is that a van that would will be available as part of the rent basically for to all all residents or is that something that is an addition that needs to be separately paid for by a resident? Um, I, ordinarily, when it's built into the pro forma, it's part of the operating part of the pro forma. It's in the uh, staff. Uh, management uh, area. And so they are not, um, in, in none of the assisted living facilities, people are not charged for the use of the van. Um, and the van is used for social activities. If you go to the concert or you go to a show or you go to the museum, you know, you find the van is filled with people. And then, um, uh, and then uh, you can arrange by appointment, medical, uh, medical appointments and so on and so forth. And the van does bring people around. They don't charge uh, because it's all built into the overall uh, rent structure. Now, with this rent structure, we talked about this a little bit today, 30% of the affordable units, 30% uh, of the income of those people in affordable units would uh, go for the rent, and then they would have 70% available of their income to go for other things. So the mix of what gets included as extra services still has to be hammered in, and hammered down. But uh, something like the van, what I, everything I've seen with the assisted living I've worked on, which are several, um, it's always been part of the uh, rent package. It's always been part of the services. Offer. So what <clears throat> there's 
I guess my concern, one of my concerns at least is, is I mean, if, if most services uh, or certainly all of the fundamental services are all sort of part of the basic operating cost and are not of extra cost to the residents of the affordable units, you don't have, or, or you have a minimal amount of invidious discrimination, so to speak, against the people who are occupying the affordable units. The more the ordinary services of life, the, the things that make the, make the uh, independent living situation attractive to the extent to which those things are sort of a la carte, uh, you come to have a sort of a class structure within the, um, <clears throat> within the, the building. Um, and what I'm sort of wondering is, first of all, kind of what what is the experience in in the other the other uh, things you had, which we had, which the, you've done with the independent living and with an affordable housing uh, part, and how should we as a board be thinking about this? Obviously, the the potential for discrimination against the affordable units or the, or the sense that they don't really belong is a concern that is not just ours, but it's a concern that's really built into 40B itself. Um, yeah. And, and, but at this point, everything seems sufficiently inchoate that it's hard for, uh, for me at least to understand what it is I'm looking at here. Yeah. Well, so, ordinarily you do your best, your very best in terms of architectural uh, entering the building and the unit types. Um, and actually, it's, it's against the law to discriminate in any way with different unit types or different levels of services for different people. And so um, you really, uh, it, and you don't see it. I mean, I don't, I don't see it very often uh, unless it's some uh, crazy thing where you've got a high rise and that's got a separate entrance with an awning and then you've got your low income uh, independent living and you go through a back door. You know, that, that's ordinarily a no-no in Massachusetts and, and people don't do it. Right. And um, um, I'm not on the floor of all these assisted living uh, uh, and uh, independent living projects I've worked on. I'm not there every day. So I can't say that there isn't discrimination, but I've never heard it discussed as, as an issue. And um, I mean, uh, our, our prospective manager uh, manages 18 of these, I think it's 18 now of these things, including four of the ones I've done. And I've never, we and I'm on the board of uh, Concord Park, and I'm on the board of Neshoba Park, and I'm on the board of uh, uh, Forestdale Park. And this has never come up as a, as a point of discussion in any of our board meetings in all the years I've been on those boards. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, I'm sure it does, but I, it's not very obvious. And uh, the people we have involved here are, uh, are gonna do their best to make sure that does not happen. And, and I think, if Sorry. I can just dovetail on that, um, the the services that are provided uh, as part of um, kind of the, the built in, and then if there are extra, that may be additional cost services. Um, that's it, it's it's the same consideration I, I would suggest, or a similar situation that you would have with any um, apartment rental. You know, there may be an ability because where the proximity of the apartment building is, if it has an affordability thing somebody may hire and bring in a private yoga instructor. And that doesn't mean that the building is discriminating against one person versus another. Um, and so there's a, there's a baseline level of services that are provided. Um, but you're right, Mr. Hanlon, that there are a range of a la carte services that one may avail themselves to or not avail themselves to. But I, I don't, I, I think that the people going into an independent living facility are, are choosing to live in an independent living facility. They're not choosing to live in an independent slash assisted slash skilled nursing facility. So it's a, it's a choice that residents are making when they're coming in that they want the independent living. And so when there's additional services that get layered on, if, if they're coming from third parties or outside sources, um, I, I don't think that that's distinctly different than in a, you know, a multifamily apartment building that has and affordability. Um. Thank you. So I have one other question of, of Mr. Zimlicki. Um, I wonder if, if you could sort of describe the age structure and the health of people who are inclined to be, who are, 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 are part of this. I, 
I, I get to be one of the people on the board who is closest to, I, I'm sure I would qualify uh, and uh, uh, I'm relatively healthy and get around and don't have an ambulance coming to the door constantly. Um, but there, at times we've been sort of thought that, that the stand, the sort of model we should keep in mind is a very elderly person in their eighties, uh, possibly uh, uh, someone whose spouse has, has passed away. Um, and I, I think it, what I'm trying to sort of get at is, is understanding the kind of the demographic of the people who are, a, who, for whom independent living with services is, uh, is attractive and the way in which that may, I mean, may differ. I mean, obviously, there's some really high rise things around here, like Brookhaven, that I assume fit logically in the same category and and may not be typical of what's involved here. Um, but you know, it's it's one thing to think about some uh, something where you have people in their 60s, 70s, and maybe some people in their 80s, and another thing if you think of this is largely people who are older than I am, and I'm near least I'm in my late 70s. Um, well, the, the demographic is all over the place. I mean, I think for independent living, well, for assisted living, I think you're looking at someone in their 80s, early 80s, probably as uh, you know, as a kind of an average person going in. Uh, for independent living, I think you're looking at people in their mid 60s to late 70s, maybe early 80s, that are in fairly good shape. Like probably you. Like I'm one of those folks too. I could go in, except my wife keeps making me go and carry sandbags in the back of the house here, uh, keep in shape. Um, but um, so uh, I think it's a healthy uh, demographic. It's, uh, it's people that are still maybe partially involved in their work and totally involved in other things, other organizations that have a fairly uh, good life. They probably have lost a, a spouse possibly and don't wanna take care of the big house anymore or they, um, uh, they're at a point where they really feel like they wanna move on from the big house. The kids are gone, maybe the wife is gone or maybe she's not, but you don't wanna, you don't wanna have to uh, maintain it anymore. I think a lot of those people are out there, especially in, in, the, in the neighborhoods we're talking about, especially like in Concord and Cambridge and, and uh, the Lexington, all the communities around you and, and, and uh, Arlington. Uh, I think that's a demographic that's probably very strong in these communities. And actually, when you think about it, there's not a lot of independent housing out there. Um, you know, we have, <clears throat> the independent housing we did in Roxbury, we did 57 units, but that's all for um, uh, people that need supportive housing and it's 100% affordable. Uh, and some of those people are a little more frail than the ones that would be going into this uh, independent living. Um, I think the people going in here would probably, could be some of the same people that are going to Florida in the winter for a couple of months. You know, they just don't want to take care of the house anymore. Um, but, that's what I've seen. They're all kind of all over the board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm fine. There are no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Are there other questions from the board? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of questions. Go ahead, Mr. Mills. Yes. Uh, yes, Mr. Zimlicki. Uh, we very much appreciate your expertise and information you brought forward. I just had a couple of questions. Uh, you gave us parking information and figures on several other sites that I'm not uh, familiar with. How would you say they compare to this site as far as location? This site being somewhat you know, distant from mainstream, although we'll have uh, a public service. How would you say this site compares to the others? You referenced. I think this is an excellent site. I mean, it's close to uh, Alewife, so you don't need a car. You can just shoot over there. It's close to the bike uh, trail if you want to get out and bike. It's close to downtown Boston if you want to get in the red line. Um, it's a it's a nice site surrounded by the water and the parks. Um, the ones I, I can compare to the Concord project is in West Concord Village, which is beautiful, which is nice, but not any better than uh, the site that we're talking about here. Um, yes. I'm like uh, really questioning more how close are they to uh, commercial areas, downtown, 
public transportation. You know, here it's a half a mile roughly to get to public transportation, whether you go to Mass Avenue or Alwife. These other developments, are they closer to public transportation in uh, commercial areas? Well, Concord is uh, in West Concord Village near the train station, but that's not really... The train, no. trains are a lot, you know, they're difficult, they're expensive, they don't run the same way as a subway and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, so that's where that is. And then uh, the Shoba Park is on the old uh, uh, Air uh, Public Hospital. It's on a hill overlooking the town. So, mm -hmm. about, you know, it's about a mile down the hill to the town uh, where, the, where the town hall is. Um, uh, let's see, uh, the one in um, uh, this, the one in, um, what am I looking at here? Um, Malden, Farstill Park, is a little bit out there. It's on the Melrose Line. Uh, it's right next to a very large public elementary school. It's about 600 kids in school. It's got a street that goes along where the cemeteries run up there. I don't know if you're familiar with the area or the Melrose mm -hmm. uh, Malden Line. So uh, it's not real close, but it's close to public transportation. It's close to the Orange Line. If you, you can walk a mile, you, or it's three quarters of a mile, you can get on the Orange Line, take it all the way downtown. It's got bus bus uh, stops that go through up and down Forest uh, Avenue, Forest Hill Avenue, that take you to the uh, Orange Line. So it's not bad, but it's probably not. It's not as convenient as your site. Yeah. Just one more question, and forgive me if I miss this information. At these other sites, do you offer? Uh, we'll call it a jitney, if you will. Yeah. Providing, do you provide a jitney at these other locations? Uh, yes, we do. I think uh, Concord shares it with Neshoba sometimes, but I think it's uh, they they pretty much uh, schedule and coordinate the scheduling of it. Um, with uh, the one in um, Malden, uh, I'm not sure of the scheduling on that one. I'd have to check and talk to the director about it. But um, yeah, they all have access to them. Well, uh, Central Boston Elder Services uh, Project in Dudley doesn't have a jitney because the personal uh, the home care attendants work with the people in the building, supportive care, to set up their appointments, their doctor's appointments, and do you know bring in meals on wheels if they have to. It's a hundred percent affordable project, and it's also right in Dudley. It's right on the tra it's right where the bus station is right there. You know, and the Orange Line's a little too far, but the bus is right there across the street. Well, thank you very much, sir. You, your information has been very helpful and illuminating. I'm all set, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Mr. Revelak, I believe you have a question. Yes. Uh, again, I'd also like to thank Mr. Zimlicki for taking the time to attend tonight. Um, I just have one question, um, which was brought up, I believe, at our last hearing, which was uh, just generally, how does one accommodate residents whose need for services may change over time? Thank you. Well, what I have found in, 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 in all the developments I've worked on and in my personal life, I mean, we're involved in this stuff, uh, is that uh, people are okay in uh, independent living as long as they can, can get around. And they're okay in assisted living as long as they don't lose their mobility. When they lose the mobility and they wind up in a wheelchair, it's okay for a while as long as that's all they've lost. I mean, you can be wheeled to the dining room, wheeled back and so forth. But if you get to a point where you can't go to the bathroom yourself, uh, you can't do anything yourself, basically you need help with everything. It starts draining the staff, uh, a huge amount of staff uh, goes into maintaining that person. And it's also demoralizing to the rest of the people in the, in the, in the facility because you know people are very sensitive. They, they know that they could wind up there themselves. And so uh, usually when that happens, um, these folks are encouraged to, in the, in, the, in the organization, the residents is encouraged to work with them to find another alternative. So if they need a more medical oriented uh, a facility or residence to be in, it's, they really have to go and start finding it or using the resources available like uh, Arlington Home Care or Cambridge Home Care, or whatever, to help them find a nursing home or a nursing facility that can handle their level of disability. Because they can go on and on. I mean, um, they can go on. Uh, I, I, my own personal life, my uh, mother-in-law was uh, in, in assisted living and she had to leave because she couldn't move or do anything anymore, basically, uh, by herself. And she wound up in a, a nursing home and she's been there about eight years. So there's just nothing you can do about it. Uh, no further questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Revlak. 
Are there other questions from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dubon? Yes, thank you. Yes, Mr. Dubon. Can't, I don't know how to do my, uh, my microphone here. Um, and I echo Mr. Zimlicki, what the others have said about, we're happy to have you here tonight. I'm really just trying to get a better feel though for uh, what the population is like. So once the building is populated with people between 65 and 80 or somewhere in that range. I think that's right. And, and so what I assume you see is you see people who are aging and then you know, their ability to live independently is going to be reduced over time. And so at some point there's gonna be a threshold where in terms of the definition of assisted living and independent living sort of gets blurred. And so I'm thinking that you probably get people who are you know, living independently and then as things start to reduce for them, they start needing more services. And that's, I think one of the things that interests me because I know that when the traffic studies are done and there are projections made and people are saying that, you know, there's going to be less traffic, less parking as compared to other iterations of this project. Um, it strikes me though, that over time, you're gonna have a situation where it builds up in terms of people needing more help coming into the building, which would logically increase the traffic that you have. And so we don't know by what factor that would be. So that's one element of the you know, parking or people coming in to provide those additional services that aren't included mm -hmm. as part of the core services, uh, which I believe are wellness, security, cleaning, and laundry. And then the next part of it too is as that same group ages, you know, we're familiar in town with seeing people go to sunrise and you have the triumvirate of the emergency vehicles arrive each time, yeah. you know, police, ambulance, and then fire. And so we don't have a sense, I don't have a sense at least, of what we would be expecting. I mean, in the beginning where you have this group of people, um, you know, is it going to be one visit per week or two or three? And then over time, I would think that that's going to increase as well until people decide that they can't handle the independent living part of it anymore. So I have a question and a concern that that is going to change over time in a way that would be significant and would impact both, you know, the parking and the traffic yeah. and all of that. So I was just wondering if you might be able to comment on that. Yeah. The, uh, the, the numbers, um, uh, I, I don't know, I guess I didn't give them to you in detail, but the numbers I had for the four different facilities, uh, Neshoba, Concord, Forestdale, and uh, uh, Roxbury, um, in, we assume they're all assisted living facilities. So your, num your number of parking spaces was being compared to facilities that are assisted living facilities, even though uh, this is an IL facility and what i'm getting at is that you've got a you've got a buffer uh of parking spaces there um because you're independent living that um you wouldn't necessarily have with assisted living in other words you're doing a lot better the, the ratios are much better but people will get older and they will age and they will need more services but when they get to a point where uh it's more than assisted living or more than assist uh, more than independent living is capable of handling, those people really have to be encouraged to move on to assisted living. Uh, uh, in this case, would be an assisted living facility rather than staying in an independent living facility because it's just going to become cumbersome to them. Um, there's no, there's no uh, non-messy way of dealing with people getting uh, older and, you know, and aging and more frail. But, uh, but basically, you got to worry about the overall population in the in the building. You, you know, people get, as I said, people get depressed when they see stuff like this. And if someone's left in that situation and they're not getting an adequate level of care, they really should move on to assisted living. They really should be encouraged to move to assisted living. And if they don't have funds for assisted living from their own pockets, there are other resources that we use. And the Shoba Park is 60% low income. Uh, Central Boston is 100% low income. So there are possibilities, there are options. But um, 
that will probably happen. People will age in place. There's no doubt about it. There will be ambulances. There will be uh, fire trucks following the ambulances. And hopefully they don't have their sirens on. Um, but uh, I don't know what the I don't know what the options are to that. Uh, if you're going to offer people decent places to live. Thank you. I, I appreciate your being direct. The other and I did have the same thought and I just wanted to follow up. So when you have the affordable component and so you have people who in the in the regular units, the you know, the market rate units. So those people who are feeling like they can't just do it in independent living anymore can probably more easily find an assisted living place. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the people who are in the affordable units, however, if they need to move, um, I don't know, perhaps you do, you know, what is the likelihood? I mean, how easy it is for those people to transition. And this may be a little bit off subject, but I'm, I'm just interested to know what happens to those people. Well, there are, there are support, it depends on, the structure of their finances really, you know, it's hard to talk in abstract, but there are, um, there are things like supplemental social security that, uh, that the state uh, offers that gives them, I forget what the number is now, 1300 a month or whatever to help towards their rent. So what you tend to start doing is you start, um, you start piggybacking things. You take maybe uh, sign them up for, um, uh, uh, for um, rent subsidies uh, through the rent Section 8 rent subsidies program. If that's not enough money, piggyback it with uh, SSI, Social Security income, which is another 1500 bucks. Uh, maybe their family chips in some money. Uh, you know, there, there are those kinds of options. But then if, you, uh, and then if you're very, very low income, there are other programs that kick in to, to help pay the Medicaid programs and so forth. I don't have all those programs in front of me. That's not what I do on a daily basis. I use those programs when we're structuring a facility and we figure out, should it be 60% low income? Should it be 100% low income? How can we make all that work? But the, the, manager, the manager that you're speaking with or that uh, the team is speaking with uh, does this all the time. They're really good at it. Uh, and they manage, I, I, I don't wanna get into saying who they are because we don't, they haven't been chosen yet and we don't have a project yet. So uh, basically uh, they're very good at it. They know how to structure it. Uh, my my mother-in-law was in Neville. She had all those assistants put in place for her because she had no money, um, and it worked out really well. Uh, and the only thing, the only problem she had was she got uh, more and more frail, and that and that followed her through. And then you wind up in, depending on the person's income, you could wind up in a nursing home, and, and that's covered uh, ninety percent by various programs. So there are programs out there. I, I can't get into them in detail now. I didn't even prep myself for it, but there's a, there's stuff available. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dupont. Were there any other questions from the board? Seeing none. Okay. Um, so just to, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll move on to public comment in a second. I just wanted to let the applicants for uh, 55 Sutherland and for 10 Sunnyside let them know. I'm going to we're going to push them back half an hour. Um, so that we have some time for public comment. Um, so with that, um, uh, so now I'm gonna open up for public comment uh, for the revised, for the discussion that we've been having here in regards to um, specifically the operations of uh, independent living in regards to parking and traffic concerns. Um, so public, Questions and comments will be taken as they relate to this matter at hand. In the interest of time, the chair requests that other topics relate to this project not be discussed at this time. All questions and comments are to be directed to the chair, who will then seek responses from the applicant or other attendees. I request that all in attendance please abide by these requests so the board is able to receive testimony in an orderly and timely manner. Um, individual public speakers will be limited to three minutes. Due to time constraints this evening, the public comment period for this hearing will and not later than 8 p.m. to allow time to discuss planning and move on to the following hearings. Um, as always, the chair encourages the public to provide written comments to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. This is especially true if you have specific recommendations in regards to this project. Uh, the procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for other prior hearings. Please rate, 
Select the raise hand button from the comments tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address. You'll be given three minutes for your questions and comments. All questions to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps us generate some accurate minutes. And once all public comments and questions have been addressed or the time allocated by the chair has ended, the public comment period will be closed uh, for this session of the hearing. So the list that I have, the first name is Mr. Urowitz. Good evening. My name is John Urowitz. I'm a 53-year resident of the town. I live at the corner of Mott and Little John Street, very close to the site. My question is first for Mr. Klein himself. Back in time, pardon me? Oh, back in time, when the town submitted its percentage of affordable housing based on land mass, we found out from the state that our numbers did not comply. The minute we didn't meet the minimum. So the state simply went and said, okay, go ahead and build. Uh, so Mugar and uh, Oak Tree and everybody have gone and designed all this stuff, spent a ton of money. Am I correct so far, Mr. Klein? Um, it's a little off topic for this evening, but just to quickly answer your question. Yes, so the town does not meet any of the statutory um, uh, limits which would allow a allow the town's decision in a 40b case to be the final decision any decision this board makes is appealable to the housing appeals committee okay and as has been mentioned several times prior to me speaking the 40b topic came up at least 25 times i stopped counting at 20. anyway with that in mind does the fact that the 40B has to do with affordable housing, has the complex, has the complexion of this new proposal by the applicant, the change to um, independent living, has that changed the requirement to meet the 40B number that was assigned before? It does not, no. It does not. So we're gonna build something, period, correct? So the board, the board, still has a decision to make um, in the, as to whether it, you know, whether it decides that the board has three options. We can either approve unconditionally, we can approve with conditions, or we can deny. And depending on that result, the applicant does have the option of appealing any decision to the housing appeals. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Klein. I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Urowitz. Next on the list um, is Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I want to uh, compliment the applicant uh, as others have done on the, um, the addition of Mr. Uh, Zimlicki to the team. He clearly has the knowledge and expertise to fill out um, the current plan in terms of uh, it being a senior living uh, development instead of what it was prior. Um, and uh, one of my questions has been answered already in terms of the assisted living versus independent living. Um, I'm glad to hear there will be a robust process to help the seniors transition when they, when they find the need to move from an independent living uh, situation to an assisted living situation. I would hope that there would be a, uh, an office as part of the management structure that would be in place to to allow for this to occur simply and easily because I think the uh, the maintaining of this as an independent senior living area uh, is important as opposed to letting it begin to kind of morph into an assisted living causing all the attendant parking problems, traffic problems, and um, um, I don't know approval situation problems when you try and use a development for a different use than it really was designed. Um, so I'm glad to hear that, that that's, uh, that's there. Um, a couple of uh, uh, simple questions that may have already been answered, but I want to uh, make sure I understand them. In terms of uh, parking spaces and people who can use them, um, are, are pretend, uh, potential um, uh, residents allowed to bring and store their vehicles in spark uh, excuse me, in parking spaces. 
Um, they, they haven't made that decision yet, but I would absolutely doubt it. And as a matter of fact, in, in, in one instance, we uh, set up some uh, rental fees for bringing a car to a, develop, to, to a development because we felt right. like the residents did not need it. And that's the best way to get someone to get rid of their old junker car is to charge them every month for it. So I, no, that, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. So go ahead, uh, no policy has been done that I'm aware of. I'm fairly new to the team, so, uh, but I'm sure that that is something that has to be, has to be dealt with, with rules and those people that should not happen. That can't be allowed to happen. Mr. Mark, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, uh, to interrupt. Um, uh, that's great because one of the uh, hallmarks of independent living is is uh, able to still uh, be mobile and move around. And even though the car may never be driven, they often follow folks to storage and storage in spaces. I think that rental approach is an excellent idea uh, for a space where <laughs> cars truly being stored but not used. Um, uh, okay, uh, in terms of the um, the the the. The jitney, the transportation being offered, I believe I heard that it was going to be offered to all residences, residents as part of the basic structure. That's currently the plan, though I know the plan is not fully designed. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? Yes, it is. Okay, so that means affordable. Re I mean, um, residents who have affordable units, residents who have market rate units, residents who are part of the duplex units, all can use this transportation. Correct. Um, I will ask um, Ms. Kiefer if she can clarify that question in regards to the duplexes because I don't know, but um, Mr. Moore, I've, I've expended your three minutes. I apologize. Ms. Kiefer? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I don't think that we have discussed that as to the duplexes. We can, I, I, Scott may want to weigh in on that. I, I suppose we can consider that, but the intention was, as you see with typical um, that that's just for the the senior living, um, but I can discuss it with our team and we can provide a, a follow up response to that at the next hearing. Okay, so Thank the duplexes you. are not included in the senior living, Mr. Jim. No, Mr. Moore. Right. Okay. Uh, and is that uh, transportation arrangement also available for free for the staff who are going to be attending to the senior living residences? Residents. I'm sorry. Mr. Jim. That is what has been expressed. Okay, so the, this jitney is going to go not only to Alewife, but also to Leahy Clinic, to uh, uh, Whole Foods or Stop and Shop, all those places on some sort of routine schedule and the residents, uh, residents kind of uh, plan their day around that schedule. So that, the, I'm sorry, Mr. Moore, the details of that haven't been worked out from okay. what they've said, but I do need to move on to other Okay, all right, thank you, sir. Thank you, I appreciate your questions. Uh, Mr. McKinnon. Hello, my name is Matt McKinnon. I live at 9 Little John Street in Arlington. Yes, please. Uh, Mr. Klein, this question will be directed to Alan. Um, I was quickly researching the businesses mentioned um, as Alan was talking. Um, and I did not see any of them uh, located in an already established uh, community such as ours. They all had dedicated roads and driveways into the community uh, for the traffic. I was curious if Alan could give me any examples of this type of development that's uh, residing in an already existing community. Yeah. Um... Shall I respond? Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, existing community uh, Concord is in the middle of West Concord Village and it goes through the parking lot where the uh, T is uh, to get to there. It's right in the middle of the business area. So it's highly visible. Uh, project that I did on uh, the independent living project we did on uh, Franklin Street in Cambridge is uh, right in back of the uh, Cambridge um, Elder Center. It's on Franklin Street uh, 411 and it's 120 unit development. Uh, that was done three, four years ago. That's independent living. Um, the project in uh, Malden is, uh, is in an existing residential neighborhood next to a school with 600 kids and parents have picked them up in the morning and dropped them off in the evening. Um, and it's surrounded by housing. Um, and uh, uh, the Shoba Park is up on a hill. 
it's in a residential community, but it's not in the middle of a highly urbanized residential community. Dudley Square is obviously in the middle of Dudley Square, which is a totally uh, urban community. Um, those so are the, the question I have is the, uh, the development will be resting on the corner of Little John Street and Dorothy Road, which are each uh, 25 feet in length. Um, none of the roads I saw from Google Maps, uh, none of the roadways at these communities, uh, they all exited out onto a roadway that was much wider uh, than the 25 feet width we have here. Uh, so I was curious if you could give me an example of a similar sized street for the uh, entrance and exits for oh. these developments. Frank, for, 411 Franklin Street's an obvious one. It's right, it's right on... I mean, you can barely make it down the street. It's, you know, right Perfect. down the so stars is. 411 and, Franklin, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Anything further? No. Nope. Uh, next on the list, um, Ms. Ide. Hi, um, Marcy Shapiro Ide. I'm at 152 Lake Street, the corner of Lake Street and Little John Streets. Um, I am a social worker at a local council on aging. So um, these are my people <laughs> who live in large um, apartment buildings. Um, I work with many, many people who live in independent senior uh, subsidized housing. Here in Arlington, we have four apartment buildings that are in the center of Arlington and one up in Arlington Heights that are all independent senior subsidized housing where people in general pay 30% of their uh, monthly income as rent. Um, I do want to say, first of all, I really don't think this is the right location for a building like this. It is off the beaten path. Um, I don't really think anything should be built in the wetlands. However, I do want to comment on what we're all talking about. And I want to paint a little bit of a picture that I think we're not really even seeing. So you're, you have a large building, we're talking about behind a row of houses with one entrance at the side. So, and I have to say with the existing buildings that are in Arlington, um, it doesn't necessarily matter if you're in Arlington Center if you're five minutes from uh, shops or you know, half an hour walk from shops, there will always be some people in this demographic who are going to be anywhere from 60 to 99 living in these types of uh, buildings. And some of them will walk. So you also have to think about all the pedestrians that are gonna be coming out and walking through. This is a lovely neighborhood to be able to walk through. So you also have to picture all of these residents, not all of them, but a, a percentage of them are going to be walking and walking around and a percentage of them are not going to be because they just don't walk. It's too far. There's nowhere to, to walk up to Cape Rada to get a cup of coffee for some people will not be manageable. Um, I made a list of all of while we were talking about the traffic. Um, if someone is in independent senior housing, this is just a a smattering, a list off the top of my head of who will be coming by. Um, sometimes once a week, sometimes every single day. Um, home health aides, PCAs, people living in independent housing have PCAs, house cleaners, family members, companions, physical therapists, occupational therapists, first responders, police sometimes on their own, fire sometimes on their own, ambulances sometimes on their own, sometimes all together. Uh, social workers such as myself make home visits quite often. Um, you have food delivery, Peapod. You have the Meals on Wheels deliveries. You have um, Uber Eats and whatever else as people age, the technology and the things that we all use will be moving down there as well. Um, the food pantry delivers to people who can't get to the food pantry. Amazon delivery trucks, nurses, um, that's just a smattering of who will be coming in to the neighborhood to visit and do the services that people need to live independently. Going outbound, first of all, in all of the senior housing that currently exists, however many parking spaces you have, there will be more than enough residents who want to park there. I think it's very ageist to say that people can't drive 
um, at later in life and they're not going to want to. A lot of people want to remain independent. So however many spaces you have, they will be filled immediately and there will be a waiting list for parking. And we are not close enough to a municipal lot as in the other buildings where people have to get an overnight parking sticker when they move in and there's nowhere for them to park their car. Um, so you'll have, in addition to all the people driving on their own, uh, the MBTA, the ride, people will be using that. People will be using this jitney that's going to be provided by the facility. People will be using the senior center van because we have two senior center vans that take people uh, to do errands and to market basket and to doctor's appointments. We have taxi service when the vans get overbooked and we need to provide more transportation. So we have taxis. We have people doing Ubers and Lyfts and taxis on their own. We'll have volunteer drivers, medical escorts that take people. Um, and so I just think that we need to have this full picture of all of these things happen every single day. You can go to visit any of the senior housing buildings that exist and you can sit there and see the cars coming in and out, the visitors coming in and out, the deliveries coming in and out. It's it's a lot. And so just because you're saying, oh, it's seniors, the majority of them are not going to be going to Alewife. I can tell you that um, there were, will be a percentage that will want to go into Boston and use it for that. But that is not going to be a huge selling point. Um, I'm just saying that um, I, I need to um, I need to move along. I apologize. Okay. All um, right. And I'm happy if anybody else has any other questions and people do age in place through the there's a program called the frail elder waiver, which is a mass health program to keep people out of nursing homes and to bring in whatever services they need because it's less expensive to do that. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about senior services in general if anybody ever has any questions. So. If, if I could ask you to forward those those two lists you put together, if you could email those and the that reference you made at the end, if you could just email that to the ZBA address. Definitely. Thank you so I much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Ms. Keith Lucas. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Heather Keith Lucas of 10 Mott Street. Good evening. Uh, recognize that tonight's discussion is focused on traffic, traffic and parking concerns. So I'll try to keep my comments focused to this as well as um, just a consideration for next steps. So as at the last ZBA meeting, there were multiple questions from the community that clearly identified that the developer had not defined what their proposal is. And at the end, I recall the ZBA made a request to the, to the to the developer to define the plan and also propose that in writing. To date, the developer has not clearly defined the population who is intended to live at the proposed Thorndike place. So as, as much as Mr. Zimlicki has provided his experience on this call, I feel it's general information. It is helpful and informative, however, Mr. Zimlicki's information seems irrelevant without knowing the true population that's intended or the services that would be included as part of this development. Um, in addition, from a timing perspective, I feel the ZBA should be afforded the respect by the applicant to be able to make informed decisions that impact our town and the prospective residents of this location. And to that point, I ask Mr. Klein for the, the ZBA and the applicant to give consideration for a substantive extension this time around, not just one that is a few weeks out, but, but one that allows for substantive discussion um, and re, uh, to have clear plans posted and reviewed and allow for clear definitions, clear details, and allow for a sub, uh, sufficient public comment period, as well as for uh, the ZBA to understand fully what the, this plan is. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oops. Um, next, uh, Ms. Shoemaker. Hello. Oh, Shoe Smith, excuse me. Hi, hello, Mr. Klein, thank you. Um, so I'd just like to echo uh, a previous comment that someone made uh, with regards to this not being the ideal location for um, this type of development. Um, I agree that for the most part, the residents will not be 
uh, walking to Alewife. Um, it's not very easy to get to Alewife, especially if um, someone is in a wheelchair. Uh, sometimes the train can be quite inaccessible if you're in a wheelchair, the elevator's not working. Um, I think for the most part, uh, it would benefit the residents the, the most to have this in an existing um, bus accessible place. So for example, Mass Ave, they could easily walk to the bakery, uh, walk to different restaurants or religious services, or use the existing bus routes that have these uh, handicap accessibility. Uh, one more point I wanted to make regarding uh, pedestrian safety around the neighborhood. So um, I'm at 53 Dorothy, Dorothy, sorry, I didn't mention that at the beginning. Um, and I have school-aged children who either walk or ride their bikes to school. Um, with increased traffic from, you know, Uber and um, different services, uh, I, would, I would be more concerned about uh, how they're getting to and from school. Um, so, yeah, that's, thank you. Thank you. Um, next on the list, I had Mr. McCabe, but I don't, I think he has lowered his hand. Um, uh, Ms. Gibson. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Mr. Klein. This is Shona Gibson. I am at 107 Mary Street. Good evening. Good evening. Um, thank you, Mr. Zimlicki, for your attendance at the meeting this evening. It's uh, very interesting to hear your perspective. Um, as, the, as a board member at Forestdale, um, you'll be familiar with my employer. I work for Cambridge Health Alliance PACE program. Uh, you probably know that we provide a, a part of the um, on-site medical service for some of the residents of, of that building. Um, I just have, uh, again, recognizing that t this evening's meeting is, is uh, primarily focused on, on parking and transportation. I, I just want to reiterate um, my, my neighbor, Matt McKinnon's observation regarding the location here. I think, Mr. Zimlicki, you're, you're very right to point out that the, that, the, that the neighborhood has a lot of amenities. Uh, however, I think that the two points that are, it's very hard to get past with any development or proposed development in this site is that uh, obviously the, the, the location itself being um, primarily wetlands is problematic for the neighborhood here. Uh, but also I would urge the board to uh, look carefully at the location of all existing independent living and assisted living facilities um, in the greater Boston area. I really, I, I've looked at this quite a bit myself and I've been in and out of many of these buildings myself and I really just don't think there is another example where a building for, for this type of purpose is tucked away into the back of a neighborhood like this. Um, I think it, a more, an equivalent might be if there were egress onto route two, that might make more sense. Or um, in fact, if the building were directly accessible from Lake Street or Mass Ave, that might be something more equivalent. I actually think tucked away um, as we are back here um, really isn't an equivalent to some of the other locations. And I would just urge the board to check that out. Um, and one other point, which I do admit is off topic regarding parking and transportation is I really just have to say to my neighbor, uh, Steve Moore, um, Mr. Moore, I wouldn't be too reassured uh, that there will be a lot of facilitation of um, folks who need to move from assisted, from independent living to other levels of living. Um, uh, something I spend a lot of time doing in my work as um, I think my, my neighbor Marcy, Marcy Shapiro I does as well, is actually trying to help people uh, manage the transition from one living setting to another. And um, you know, understandably, if, if somebody's running an in independent living facility, they, they might have, um, they might want to point out to the resident, you know, perhaps you're some way in some, in some way outstaying your welcome, you're no longer really appropriate here. But I think it's not much of a stretch of imagination for any of us to imagine how we might feel if we were that individual, or if we were that individual's family. Um, it's just a natural part of human nature to not really like change. Um, 
people often don't really move to these types of buildings until some sort of circumstance forces them to look at it. And then they are generally very reluctant to make a second move to a more restricted environment. I, I think that's, I, I just say that that has just been my experience over, over the couple of decades that I've done this work. And I've never seen the building, um, any building management step in to, to lay out the, the practical options for the person. So I, I just think people need to, to just have their eyes open to that. I think it will inevitably become an assisted living, even if it's not one in name. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Mr. Seltzer? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I'd like to take advantage of Mr. Zemlicki's presence here to um, bring up a question that I asked at a previous hearing. Are four handicapped spots sufficient for a senior community of this size? Mr. Zimlicki? Oh, we we're guided, we had a little discussion about this this morning. We're, we're obviously guided by building codes as to the number of spaces, which doesn't really answer your question. Uh, we actually are gonna look further at, uh, at the number of spaces that we have and probably can't get to the ideal spot, but we probably can get to a good spot in terms of having accessibility and, and, and number of spaces. But obviously we're required by code to provide a certain number. So, thank you. I'm thank you very you, much. I'm not giving you a very specific answer, but I, I'm saying that it still needs some work. Sure, I understand. Uh, four is uh, the minimum required under ADA requirements for a general population. Um, where this is an entirely senior population, I think it would be called for to have somewhat more than um, the four spaces that the state requires for just any apartment building of this size. I'm glad that you're considering it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Um, so I, so we're looking to close the hearing the public comment in just a minute here. Uh, but Mr. DiBiase had his hand raised quickly. Thank you very much. Robert DiBiase, 29 Little John Street. Um, my question is basically about the traffic as we've talked about in terms of uh, building going up with assisted living. We're going to be looking at possibly, you know, multiple trips of emergency service equipment coming and going from the facility and so forth. And when you look at the distance of the road of 29 Little John Street, at that point at 25 feet. If there's people parked, such as an Uber or a Lyft, waiting to pick up somebody for this facility, and you've got cars on both sides and somebody's trying to come up the street, you cannot get an emergency piece of apparatus down the street. Now, if they are parked overnight or parked during the day with nobody sitting in them, you're not gonna get through. So I'm just asking that they look at the traffic entailed here to say, okay, whether or not we can handle getting somebody in and out in an emergency situation on something that's gonna be a regular basis based on the age group. Now, I myself have a father and a father-in-law that are both in their nineties. They still drive. They drive very well too. Scary. So, it is scary. <laughs> it is scary. And you know, one of them can back up on a straight line. The other one takes <laughs> everything in sight. <laughs> so uh, you have to take that for what it's worth as well. But I just hope that whatever we're trying to push through here, we take in all of these um, pieces of information and, and kind of pull them together because you don't want to see someone, you know, unregrettably pass away because an, uh, an EMT couldn't get down the street because cars were parked. Yeah. And especially if it was because people working in the building were parked on Little John Street or Dorothy Road or something like that. So I would like them to just take a look at some of those numbers and some of those distances uh, on the street and see whether or not they really meet for yeah, apparatus yeah. coming and going. And I would think, and, and I don't, again, I've only been involved in this for a few days, but uh, I know that the developer will probably meet with the appropriate authorities, including the fire department to make sure that their requirements are met. I would hope so. And as uh, you've only been involved for a few days and you might not know, but I am a general contractor of 32 years. So I have been involved in a lot of big developments in Cambridge, Boston and surrounding towns. So I'm well aware of the codes and well aware of what's needed. You know, so far I've, I've kept back and watched and listened. So- uh, And you know, when the fire department says you should do X, Y, or Z, you don't argue with them because they say, are you gonna be responsible? 
That's correct. When someone dies. Yeah. So we know we have to go through that process. I understand that as well. Thank you, Mr. DiBiase. Thank you. Uh, last speaker will be Ms. Fredman. Hi, thank you so much. My name's Lisa Fredman. I live at 63 Mott Street. I've talked to this board before about my experience taking care of my father when he lived in independent living. And I raised my hand because I think that both Marcy and Shona Gibson have raised really important considerations that we should all think about. I'm sure that many of you have also been caregivers to your parents. When my father was invited to move to a dementia unit in the independent living facility that he lived in, it was in New York City, but that's beside the point. My sister, who was his other caregiver, really objected. So we did everything we could to keep him in his apartment until the end of his life. And how does that, what does that have to do with what we're talking about tonight? We were fortunate to qualify for home hospice, but if we hadn't qualified for home hospice, we probably would have qualified for another type of home care um, service. We had 24 hour home health aides. That meant that we had a home health aide coming in during the day, another one coming in at night. Because we had home hospice, we also had the hospice nurse, we had the hospice nutritionist, we had the hospice social worker. All of these people were making regular visits to my father to make sure that he was safe and that he could actually stay in the independent living room, the studio apartment that he had. I visited every other week. My sister visited every day. If he had been living in this facility in Thorndike Place, that would have been six or seven cars just for one person. He had been living in this independent living facility for 10 years. He did not want to move. My sister was adamant that he should not move. Consider what this will do to our neighborhood if we have this facility here. It's just unimaginable. But I think those of you who've been caregivers as I've been, and Marcy clearly has experience with this and Shona has experience as a nursing, as a nurse, this is what happens. And our neighborhood just cannot support this. It's not a good idea to have in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Redmond. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and close public comment for this evening. I really appreciate um, all the comments from the public, especially those with um, expertise in this area. Um, it's always fascinating during public comment period how many people have relevant experience in a lot of these issues. So I really appreciate the comments. Um, so for going forward, um, on this here on the, uh, for uh, Thorndike Place. Um, so we have a date penciled in for July 13th as being our next hearing date. Um, just members, so obviously from the discussion this evening, um, there's still a lot of questions about um, emergency services access um, into, this, into this area. Whoops, beg your pardon. Um, and there's also questions about just sort of the, the amount of traffic, questions about the, the number of accessible spaces. Um, and I think that you know, the, the more general questions about you know, who, is in the, who is in the units, um, the level of care they need, um, obviously those impact the, you know, the amount of tra traffic and the amount of parking that's required. But as far as you know, the, the regulations involving 40B, um, those are those specific questions are, are not um, entirely within our purview, as I understand. Um, so I would ask just quickly, members of the board, are, is there anything else you would specifically like to ask the applicant to address um, between now and the next hearing date? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> I think part of it is going to happen anyway, but we have uh, we have a number of questions that have been raised in the materials that the peer reviewer has <clears throat> has presented, um, and we're kind of at a point where we just need to know 
and put firmly in one column or the next, whether this is something that's agreed to and that we can put that in the, it's not a live issue anymore or something where there's a, gen, a genuine issue. Because I think, you know, the underlying problem is, is that we need to, with every meeting to make the issues grow, the range of issues grow smaller rather than bigger. And we haven't always succeeded in moving in that direction, which which is fine because you know the project has generally developed in a in a in a better way. Uh, but still, it, we're getting down to 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 the end. Um, secondly, I'm interested in those places. Like for example, one of the comments of the peer reviewer. Uh, is that the applicant should be doing more to, at least between now and construction, to uh, get a hold on what the actual groundwater levels are during the peak, the peak area. Um, that's something that's important. Uh, the possibility of increasing the flow north towards uh, Dorothy Road is, is also important. Um, we are not at peak season at this point. And so at some point we need to figure out how it is we're going to deal with this. We are probably not going to do it by extending the, the hearing date by six months or a year. Uh, so we have to kind of have a plan. And I, so I, we would like to, to see that, that plan develop. Um, it would be nice if Mr. Uh, Thornton and uh, Mr. DeRuyter could look a little bit behind. I mean, to some extent, we've talked a lot about, you know, person by person who might come to an assisted living home or to a uh, independent living, but all of those things are sort of taken into account in the ITE's traffic generation figures to begin with as, as an average. Um, and I don't know that, that there's any reason to expect this to be different from the range of, of homes that they're dealing with. But obviously the traffic experts need to take into consideration the things that have been said today. And I don't think it's quite enough to say that, well, however it is, it's better than the last proposal we had on the table because this board at least never agreed that the last proposal was acceptable at all. So uh, at, we need to somehow have, be, have some reasonable assurance that we understand the degree to which there's going to be, a, there may or may not be a traffic problem. And at this point, people are kind of talking past each other because they're talking at a different level of generality. And the final thing is the same issue we had on the so-called other, uh, which keeps changing, of course, depending upon which hearing we're at. Um, but eventually Mr. Havity is going to have to be writing a draft decision. Uh, that decision is going to have conditions in it. I assume that Ms. Kiefer and her team are going to want to provide comments on those things and is not going to want to have the hearing closed before uh, they have the opportunity uh, uh, to do that. And in order to get that done, we have to have a plan, both for Mr. Haverty to produce the document that that he's planning to, to do and enough time for people to look at it and to uh, and not just Ms. Kiefer, but other people as well, including the people who just spoke, um, and provide their input on the adequacy of these conditions and, and so on. So uh, there's we, we're sort of near the end, but there's going to be a lot of a, a lot of passes thrown in the last two minutes, and I think that. Uh, we need to sort of decide exactly how those two minutes are going to be structured and uh, afford ourselves uh, enough time to, to, get, to get the work done. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Mr. Revelak. Thank you, Revelak, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, I echo Mr. Hanlon's uh, feeling about getting, uh, receiving comments to the most recently submitted uh, set of peer review documents. Um, it would be I two other things I'd, I would hope to see. Uh, one would be just a just sort of a more formal description of how the uh, applicants envision this project. Um, and the second would be a an updated list of waivers. I think it would be useful to, to have that as well. As I, I agree with Mr. Hanlon in the sense that we're getting down to the, um, you know, we're getting down towards the end. And 
Um, not to be too blunt, but it would be nice to wrap up the loose ends and um, you know actually get to making a decision. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. Mr. Chair. Comment? Mr. DuPont. Yeah, I uh, also agree generally with what the two of my co-members have said. But I have to say that I, I feel as if with the flexibility that the applicant has shown and the different iterations of the project, I just want to be absolutely clear that uh, those concerns that I think were expressed so eloquently by Ms. shapiro Ide, Ms. Keith Lucas, and Ms. Gibson with respect to what they see in terms of their real life experience um, as to what the traffic generation looks like. Uh, I want to make sure that our experts are going to confirm that because I don't know what I don't know with regard to that at this point. That's how I feel, honestly. And I feel like our job is to be fact finders and decision makers. And I'm not at all clear on the facts. I do think that um, you know, the comments of the Mr. Uh, Zimlicki were extremely helpful for background, but I want to make sure that we have enough time and I don't want to be just doing this, you know, incremental, you know, a little bit more time and a little bit more time. I want to make sure that we have enough time because I, you know, in using bad sports metaphors, I don't want to give up the opportunity to bat in the ninth inning. And that's what I feel like is happening a little bit here. So while I agree with what Mr. Hanlon and Mr. Revelak said, I'm not entirely convinced that we have enough information. And I do want what was presented to us in terms of traffic and parking to be confirmed by our people so that we know going in that we have the facts that we need to make the decision. And along those lines, if I can just throw out, I mean, we're getting into the heart of the summer and you know we've been at this for well over a year and i do know that people have vacation plans in august primarily as far as i understand it and i would like to see that taken into account so that people can take a breather and be able to you know so rest up so that we uh, can get into the home stretch if of course we could finish before that that would be great but my honest feeling right now is that we don't have the information and the time to process the information to get to that point before this meeting is closed. So I just wanna throw that out there for other people to consider, including the applicant. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Mr. O'Rourke. Mr. I do wanna echo Mr. DuPont's comments as well as the other members. I just feel like we've got an, almost a new project here. We've been at this for a long time. We, and I just feel like it's been it's being rushed uh, because we all want it to end. And I think we have to resist that. Uh, with summer here, people taking vacations, I just don't know how we can fully consider um, all the new issues and give the town committees time to comment, the public time to comment, and everybody feels satisfied by the process by getting this done uh, by you know July 13th and then another week or two after that. I just don't think that happened. So, you know, really, I think we need an, a longer extension than that, so, you know, substantially longer to be able to consider this properly and have everybody come out of the process, at least feeling that the process was thorough. Thank you. Thank you. Any further from the board? Seeing none. Um, so Ms. Kiefer, we discussed previously continuing to uh, Tuesday, July 13th. That's right. So confirm that still works for your team? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, does the board have an opinion about start time? Do we want to go 6.30 or 7.30? Give a like, Mr. Chair. Um, I would prefer 7.30, but could do 6.30 if necessary. Second to seven thirty. Okay, I third that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> well, with that, then um, I would may I have a motion to continue tonight's hearing until Tuesday, July thirteenth, twenty twenty one, at seven thirty p.m. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. 
Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, roll call vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Revelac. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on Thorndike Place until Tuesday, July 13th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. Thank you all very much for your participation this evening. Thank you very much to Appent and uh, especially Mr. Uh, Zemicki for joining us. Um, thank you all. So we will transition now to um, one of our local cases. Mr. Chairman, may I ask? Yes, please. Um, what are we doing on further extensions than on Thorndike? I don't know if Mr. Havity needs to chime in here in terms of, does it all have to be by agreement with the applicant at this point or? Um... So, so we've closed the hearing about Thorndike, so we can't talk about it specifically, but uh, my understanding in general on 40B is that extensions need to be by mutual agreement of all parties. Um, is Mr. Havity still on it? He already jumped. I think he jumped off fast. Okay. Okay, uh, so now turning to uh, local public hearings on tonight's agenda. Um, after I announce each agenda item, I'll ask the applicant to introduce themselves, make their presentation to the board, I'll then request members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. And after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. Uh, before I do so, does anybody need a couple minutes to grab some additional water? I know I am sweating up a storm here, so I will ask if we, for us to take a two minute break here just to uh, to refill on on fluids i'll be right back that is very generous mr chair see you in two Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. May, I was hoping uh, we talked earlier if I could sign off for the rest of the meeting have, and uh, you're all set with that. We seem to have a good complement of people. I think you are all set. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. O'Rourke. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moore. Yes, if I could make a suggestion. If you're feeling a little bit overheated uh, where you're sitting, you might want to take a dip in that uh, background you have there. It looks like a nice floodplain area. <laughs> Just a thought. Yes, that's appreciate that. Thank you. I should hit. Unfortunately, the the limited number of air conditioners have been apportioned to bedrooms in my home and not to workspaces. Uh, check in, make sure the members of the board are back. So Mr. Mills is back. Mr. Ford is back. Mr. Revlack is back. Mr. Hanlon is back, you know, Mr. DuPont, and we are good to go.
Mr. DuPont, are you back? Roger, you you with us yet? Roger, you back with us? See, si, yes. Oh, all right. So the next item on our agenda is docket number 3659, which is 55 Sutherland Road. Um, if I can ask the applicant to make themselves known and explain to us what they would like to do. Mr. Glassman. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Adam Glassman, GC Architects. Uh, to Worthington Street, Cane Mass, and I'm representing uh, Rabitha Amarasingham, uh, the owner of 55 Sutherland Road. Uh, it's an existing, non-conforming, uh, modest two-family. She lives on the first floor and rents out her second floor. And we are here tonight seeking relief to move an existing concrete step and uh, place it with a larger, non-conforming covered entry port. Should I be uh, sharing my screen? Um, if you can. Is that how you, should, uh, am I yeah, presenting the drawings? Would, yeah, that would yeah. be appreciated. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Rick, can you take care of that? Mr. Chairman, Adam is already set to go. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Well, I, thank you. So here on our cover page, you can see the existing street. Um, on the upper right hand corner uh, on the left is the existing uh, 28 square foot um, mostly uncovered landing we'd like to remove uh, down on the bottom are the two elevations used the rest of the house remains uh, un unchanged uh, for this work. The proposed uh, 50 foot covered uh, entry would be consistent with her uh, one story bump outs covered entries. Um, in her neighborhood, on her street, adjacent to her home. Um, I should add that uh, originally, um, Rabitha came to me seeking um, help with this project because as she gets older, um, these stairs are becoming much more difficult. Uh, they're uncovered, um, which creates uh, often an unsafe and the size of the landing is also prompted buff um, and a, a conforming um, entry, uh, which the code does permit in some instances, wouldn't work here with two side by side doors. Um, the, the three and a half by seven foot uh, landing wouldn't work in this case. And that's part of her, her hardship here. Uh, the existing site plan. Uh, you can see that the is non-conforming due to left side setback, right side setback, front yard setback. Uh, in this next slide, um, we just show the footprint of the 10 by 5 uh, covered entry porch and some associated uh, improved landscaping and walkway work. Again, very simply, uh, you know, modest in scope, 
blends with the neighborhood, uh, consistent with the character of the neighborhood, uh, won't project uh, shadows on adjacent properties or create a lot of parking or, or uh, light pollution, uh, blow up of our landscape work, uh, it was something more a uh, paper system, uh, some low voltage exterior lighting. And that, that is it, less, less complicated than the last project, um, hopefully less <laughs> controversial. Thank you. Um, are there questions from the board? Mr. Revelak? I've, um, I've basically got two, perhaps three questions. Um, the first one is, this might be for Mr. Valorelli, and, I, and I'm, this is just more of a, kind of a little bit of a bylaw question just for my own edification. Section 539A, which we're, um, you know, here to talk about tonight, you know, it applies to projecting eaves, chimneys, bay windows, balconies, open fire escapes, and enclosed entrances of not more than 25 square feet. And there's a B part to that sep section, which implies to unenclosed steps, decks, and the like. And I'm just curious, um, you know, and, and for Mr. Valorelli or for any other member of, of the board, um, why this, these sort of porch projects are traditionally um, taken under 539A? Um, I can answer that, Mr. Chairman, if you like. Please. Yeah, Mr. Revlack, so 5.3.9 projections into minimum yards is split into two sections, primarily uh, C is um, we don't get into that too much. But part A deals with enclosed entrances that exceed 25 square feet. Mm -hmm. And part, part B uh, <clears throat> deals with unenclosed steps such as decks. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, the, the, they're very uh, specific in what they're talking about. Enclosed entrances, part A, and um, open decks, staircases, that mm -hmm. sort of thing, part B. Does that answer your question? Okay, so in this case, we're, it's treated as um, enclosed because it's covered. Yes, yeah, so real quick, part A. So I was told historically, many people wanted vestibules for, for many reasons, especially get out of the weather. Mm -hmm. So um, the ZBA at the time, way back when, was getting bombarded with these requests for simple little vestibules because they encro encroached on the front yard. So they said, okay, well, look, at here's what we'll do. You can build a vestibule doesn't, it cannot exceed three and a half feet off of the foundation. It can't exceed 25 square feet in area. If you can keep it to that dimension, you can go ahead and build it by right. So in this case here, it exceeds that. So we're dealing with part A of uh, 5.3.9. Okay. Th and, um, thank you for uh, for the little history and that's, that's useful to know. Um, my second question, Mr. Chair, uh, involves the dimensional worksheets. Um, so the application lists a lot area of 4,000 square feet. So the, you know, it also lists 1,369 square feet of usable open space, uh, 2,217 square feet of landscaped open space, and a first floor area of 1,104 square feet. Altogether, these add up to more than 4,000 square feet. So I'm just curious i'm just curious to know which of the lot parse lot areas were deemed um to be you know open use usable open space and landscaped open space uh, i suppose that one's for me uh, please mr glassman yeah um i'm sorry if, if i if i uh if there are errors on the dimensional Um, as I recall, I believe usable open space, is it 15 by 15 in Arlington? Uh, 25 by 25. Oh, okay, so essentially the whole backyard would qualify as usable open space. Uh, um, landscaping um, would be the entire lot aside from the driveway. Um, 
the common area in the back, I, you know, I think we consider a patio. Okay. So, uh, but basically to just sort of get to the meat of it, yeah. um, because the, it looks like the house is set back 17 and a half square feet or 17 and a half feet. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. So we know the porch isn't taking away uh, usable open space from the front. Um, so it's, you know, there's shouldn't be any reduction in usable open space. Um, and for landscaping open space, right, right. we need to make sure that there are, you know, you have 10% and it looks like the gross floor, floor area is um, 2,242 square feet. And I'm just wondering, can you point to a spot on the plot plan that has 242 square feet of landscape space? Well, this, this area in the backyard mm -hmm. certainly exceeds that. Mm -hmm. How about the side yard? Uh, yeah, landscape space, absolutely. Okay, that looks good to me. Uh, no further questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Revelat. Other questions from the board? And then Mr. Glassman, do you know the nature of the easement that's on the property? Uh, I think I'd, I'd like uh, Ravita to, to speak to that. She probably knows more about it than I do. Please, Ravita, please go ahead. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, what was the question? I missed that. Ravita, can you want me to? I missed the question. Oh, sure. So the, the plan, the, the land. Ravita, there's, there's a, there's an. Shows an easement on the, you know, facing your house on the right hand side of your house. There's a, something that's labeled as an existing easement. That's 10 feet, that's a uh, seven feet wide that runs up your property line. And we're just curious what it, what the easement is for. Oh, easement is that the, to the right of the property is just like a, it's a paved, it's tarred all the way back. And I don't know what you mean, I guess I'm kind of lost, but it's just, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think behind my house is Pamela, someone, a Weinstein, and they had closed that little, there's an egret over there, I think. That's it. it's, I don't know if that answers your question. It's just an open, uh, it is just a paved, uh, walkway on yeah, it, it, it almost it's, it almost sounds like some kind of uh, like an old easement that's almost yeah and it looks we, like it maybe this, goes back to right, right, right. I don't know that was my question um yeah we I mean I don't know if this is originally for uh, an egress or an access, but we there, there is no impact on. It. Okay. It was always like that from the uh, thought it, so I have uh, no idea what you're yeah. I guess yeah, I've yeah, yeah, never had to face uh, it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry we don't know more about it, but we're re it's, it's the existing conditions okay. remain unchanged. It, it, it's outside the area that's affected, so it shouldn't it shouldn't be a big issue. Um, and then there's a, the, there was a memorandum issued by the Department of Planning and Community Development um, that's reviewed the application, their recommendation. Um, I don't think there were any questions specifically raised uh, by the, by that memorandum. Um, so it, Seeing no other questions from the board, um, I will go ahead and open the meeting for public comment. Um, as before, pu public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. The chair asks that those wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, please be patient, allow those wishing to speak for the first time to go ahead of them. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. To be called upon by the chair, you'll be asked to give your name and address and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Um, so Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Uh, and I'm a member of the Arlington Tree Committee. 
Uh, I'd like to ask through you, Mr. Chair, is Sutherland Road a public way? Good question. Um, does the applicant know if this is, speak to whether this is a public way or a private way? I mean, it's, it, it's not a private way. Okay, Mr. Chairman, that, that answers that question. I noticed that there was a tree in front of the, the house, uh, probably in line with where the project's going to go. It's a street tree, so it's protected. Uh, it's a protected tree. Uh, and I just want to um, uh, ask that the applicant and their, their particular contractor be careful to use the proper protections when doing this project. My guess is that there will be a lot of uh, heavy construction activity, but there will be some. This is not a very large tree. It's going to need protection. If you need to know what the protection guidelines for the, the, the trees are, uh, they're available on the um, the Arlington Tree Committee uh, website. And if they are difficult to find there, they're certainly available through the Public Works Department. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, see the, Amara Singham, did you want to speak? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, I guess I'm making this request because, uh, as you know, without the covered entry porch right now, when it snows, literally, I cannot open my front door to get out. I've managed to do this all these years, but now I realize I want to live here and continue to advance in age, and I think it's safe. And in fact, when I open the door, often I cannot even put a little bag on that little landing. So, which is why we've gone through all of this and I'm hoping all of you would approve of this. And I've certainly provided letters of support from my immediate neighbors all around me who have been, uh, we are a wonderful community here. And uh, in terms of the tree, I would like Mr. Moore to know that I'm a plant and bird and butterfly lover. There's three houses around us. We all work together. We plant um, we are re replacing all our plants with native uh, New England plants and shrubs. So I don't think you would have to be worried about the tree at all. Then we are trying to protect and create a better atmosphere for ourselves. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public who wish to speak on this? Seeing none, I will go ahead and close the public comment. Um, Discussion from the board. I think this is a very straightforward application, a very reasonable request. Um, we do have the there's the three standard conditions that we put on um, on special permits, which I will just read uh, quickly for the record. Uh, number one is the plans and specifications approved by the board for the permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. Shall be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, number two, the building inspector is hereby notified he is to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time he determines violations are present and the inspector of buildings shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw under the provisions of chapter 40 section 21 D and institute non criminal complaints if necessary the inspector of buildings may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1 and standard number three. Uh, the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grant. Um, I would also um, recommend to the board. Um, a possible other uh, condition, which would be that the area of the new porch is not to be considered within the foundation wall of the building. Um, this just applies to future development that if there was a, a future expansion of the second floor, it cannot be expanded on top of uh, this new roof by right. Are there any questions about the, the conditions? None. May I have a motion, Chairman? 
Mr. Hanlon. I move that the uh, Board of Appeals approve this application subject to the three standard conditions and the additional condition that uh, the chairman just read into the record uh, relating to the uh, definition of the foundation. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. <clears throat> okay, quick roll call vote. Um, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Aye. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Uh, in the absence of Mr. O'Rourke, um, ask Mr. Revelak. Aye. Chair votes aye. You are approved. So the next step is the board will prepare a written decision, uh, which will be voted on at our uh, at our next earliest option. Um, and then at that point, uh, the decision is final. So thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you very much too. Take care. So this brings up docket number 36610, 10 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, I believe Mr. Anessi is here to uh, represent the applicant. I am. And Mr. Glassman, before you sign off, if the yeah. chair could go ahead and um, withdraw his hosting so it doesn't accidentally close the hearing. We all set. Yep. Rick, are we okay with Mr. Glassman signing off? We are. Okay. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Hey. <laughs> all right. Mr. Inessi. Yes. Good I'm evening. Here. Thank you for your patience. Okay. That's fine. Uh, am I ready to go? I think that's more a question for you. Pardon me? We're ready for you when you're ready. All right, I'm ready to go. Uh, right. this, is a, this is a request for a special permit. It relates to uh, <clears throat> an automotive uh, 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 a property, essentially, uh, that has been used as an automotive property at 10 Sunnyside Ave for many years, uh, going back, I believe, to the year 1920. Uh, if any of you have gone down and taken a view, I think you'll see that uh, it's been very blighted uh, and it's been in that condition for quite a while. Uh, now, I was involved in some prior petitions before the ARB on this particular uh, uh, property. Uh, and we went before the ARB with mixed use projects. Both of those were withdrawn. Uh, one of them because of the fact that the, uh, my client lost the contract, so could not go forward with it. And that one uh, proposed 22 uh, units. Uh, and that would have been 22 additional residential units in that neighborhood. Uh, the second one uh, uh, was for my present client. And we did some rethinking uh, on that project, that was going to be a bit uh, of mixed use as well. And uh, part of the problem is uh, that Column Health, uh, which is located at 339 Mass Ave. And by the way, if you're not familiar with Column Health, Column Health deals with uh, uh, substance abuse uh, uh, treatment for individuals, mental health treatment for individuals and the like. So uh, it deals with pretty sensitive issues. None of those issues are going to be dealt with at this particular property. What we're proposing to do is have a change of use from the automotive use uh, to an office and conference use. And what would happen would be the uh, individuals at uh, 339 Mass Ave would use the, uh, the renovated space uh, that we're talking about for the purpose of office and conference space. Uh, now we're talking about a fairly large size lot. We're talking about a lot containing 
16,500 square feet. Uh, and, uh, the other aspect of this that I think uh, comports with the master plan is that we are proposing to change a prior automotive use to a different use, an office use. And if you look at the definition uh, in the vehicular oriented business district B4 in the zoning bylaw, uh, the very last portion of that uh, uh, definition basically says, Arlington has an abundance of automotive and auto automotive accessory sales and service establishments. As these businesses uh, gradually close, the town has encouraged conversion of the property to other retail, service, office, or residential use, particularly as part of a mixed use development. Now, the reason we're not before the ARB is we're not doing a mixed use development and we don't fall within the, uh, the purview of any of the other sections under environmental design review that would trigger jurisdiction in the ARB. So that's the reason before, we're before the Zoning Board of Appeals and not before the ARB. Uh, we're staying within the footprint of the building. Uh, we're not going to go outside the footprint uh, of the building. The work that's going to be done is going to be done on the inside of the building. And uh, I'm accompanied, by the way, uh, this evening by two of the principals of the petitioner, Jim McIntyre and Colin Beatty. I'm also accompanied by the architect for the project, uh, Will Chaflin. And <clears throat> when Will takes over, I'm going to ask if we can screen share. And I did talk with Rick Val uh, Valarelli about this earlier, Chris. And I think we can make that happen because uh, uh, I'd want Will to show the plans and screen share the plans. So we feel that uh, this petition uh, comports with the master plan. Uh, we feel that uh, it's something that can be allowed uh, with respect to a special permit. Uh, and uh, Jenny Rake uh, feels that way uh, from the planning department as well because the planning uh, department submitted a report essentially in favor. Uh, she basically had a comment about the fact that we did not inc in include enclosed parking. Well, I sent in a revised plan, which uh, you'll see in, uh, momentarily, okay, that shows four enclosed bicycle parking uh, spaces. In addition to the other spaces, that we have, and we have ample bicycle parking spaces. We have more than we need. Uh, the, with respect to parking, uh, we have more parking spaces than we need as well. Uh, 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 again, I, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, as counsel for the petitioner, uh, uh, I, I feel that this particular property is going to be an improvement to the area. It's going to get rid of a blighted uh, uh, section down there. Uh, the work that's going to be done on the property, as you will see from the plans, is going to make it uh, very attractive uh, in, in the neighborhood. And it's not going to be an intrusive use, as would uh, be the case if, if it was a furtherance of an automotive use. So, Will, if you're there, which I hope you are, I haven't talked with you in the last couple of hours, uh, but if, if you are there, Will, would you jump in at this point? Absolutely, Bob, thank you. Uh, I would ask, uh, I believe it's Rick to give me permission to Rick share my screen. Yeah. Uh, can I do that, Mr. Chairman? Please do. Yeah, you're good to go, Will. Thank you very much. And if I could just get a thumbs up from anybody to let me know if they can see my screen, that'd be great. And indeed. Excellent. Thank you so much. So my name again is Will Chalfont from Palsa Design. We're located on Ivalu Street in Somerville, Mass. And as Bob mentioned, this, pro this lot has seen many, many versions, many iterations here. And I've actually been involved in the last few. Um, and so I'm quite familiar with the site. I'm familiar with the area in general. Uh, go to the dentist right around the corner. So I know what, uh, what this lot looks like and um, what we're looking to do here. So just quickly as an overview, uh, bird's eye view here of the site in question here. Um, we're in this area, excuse me, this area here. I know I'm killing you with lots of colors, but this is mostly just to show our proximity to the different zones in the immediate area. 
whether that be um, the uh, B2 zone, R1 zone, R2, and so forth. And of course, our um, B4 zone located here in pink. So as Bob mentioned, the existing, existing lot here, this is an existing survey outlining the uh, existing garage as well as um, what I would call an appendage that was added at some point. And then this sea of gravel and uh, debris as it currently sits. So we're actually looking to uh, lose some square footage from the existing uh, building. We're gonna be losing approximately 800 square feet. Uh, things that are dashed in these drawings here are going to be demolished. So there's this, uh, as I mentioned, there's, there's currently a very steep ramp that goes down to the lower level. This was obviously an auto body and, and uh, car use for a long time. So they had a sort of makeshift uh, uh, daredevil ramp that went down to that lower level. And so we're looking to remove that area as well as uh, refurbish the, get rid of the existing uh, garage doors, put some nice new glass garage doors there that are a little more engaging to the public, uh, as well as, uh, you know, clean up the building in general uh, and add some, uh, well, I'll get into some of the other things as we go forth. So from a site plan standpoint here, the building is outlined in red. Uh, the, the part that we're demolishing is actually, if you can see my cursor, was in, in this area here. And I think the important things to, to point out here is, is what we're, we're gaining from this, thought, um, from this project, not what we're losing. We're actually gaining close to 4,400 square feet of landscape space. This is currently a, really a, an asphalt wasteland, as it were, with some uh, abandoned cars and things of that nature. And while we are adding some surface parking, we're looking to buffer that area entirely with some nice green space, as well as providing um, space for bicycle parking. And we intend to uh, use solar panels on the existing roof. Um, and, and we may not show as many as we're showing right now. We'll defer to our solar specialist on that. But the intention is to uh, make this a very energy efficient project, even though it's an existing building, it's an adaptive reuse, uh, which in itself is a green practice. So we are providing uh, more bike parking than's necessary. We're also providing a couple more spaces that are necessary. Uh, I, I think, I don't want to speak for the applicant. I'm sure we could actually lose a couple spaces if that was the board's um, desire, but really we wanted to provide ample parking for the executive staff that's going to use this space. And I, I don't want people to get the impression that this is going to be some sort of cubicle farm by any means. Uh, the intention is this is a place for the executive team of Column Health to uh, get together um, and you know, meet, collaborate, and, and occasionally have conferences here. This is not going to be a, a hustling and bustling lot with cars coming in and out of it. I mentioned earlier the daredevil ramp that was going down to the existing basement. So what we're proposing is a, a much more comfortable uh, ramp to access that space. We're looking to, the, to utilize the building as it is, so we might as well get access down to it. And we've got the ability to really shield this ramp in the back of the site. Um, and a much more comfortable grade that won't uh, make your car bottom out if you're to go down there. This is mostly gonna be used for uh, delivery of items. It's, it's not, and not much more than that. Uh, and this is that basement here. We're adding a new stairway down there. Um, currently there's a stair that uh, if you're taller than five, six, you're not gonna have your head anymore. So we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna bring that up to code. And this entire space is really mainly intended to be used for storage, not office space. So this is the uh, ground floor level, just to orient you. Uh, Sunnyside is here on the right-hand side. So uh, the, uh, the Column Health bought this with uh, as is. So that meant, means that they got all the equipment that came with it. So one unique thing that we're going to be doing is using the former paint booth as a conference room. So it's sort of a uh, unique adaptive use, reuse of what was there. Obviously that'll be cleaned thoroughly. Otherwise those will be some pretty quiet meetings. But uh, the intention is for that to be sort of a, you know, unique space within here. We're proposing a, a live green wall. The existing slab is actually in great shape. We're gonna polish that up. So it's gonna be a sort of an industrial feel in here. We're adding a little lobby space, a couple restrooms. And again, as Bob mentioned, we, we've added an indoor bike uh, place so that we have outdoor and indoor um, bike parking. So, you know, here I'm going to go through the elevations quickly. The, the exterior really is not changing more than we're, as I said, uh, replacing these garage doors with something a little more um, reliable and attractive. 
putting a new sign, which I know Bob has mentioned, and I think the report mentioned, we obviously have to go for a, a, a separate uh, sign permit for that, but the sign is, as shown, um, compliant with town regulations. Uh, the existing building is a grayish color. I think uh, that actually fits with a lot of Column Health's branding, so I, it may get a fresh paint job, but I think it, it's not gonna look a lot different than it currently does. Uh, side elevation showing some of our proposed solar panels, their existing skylights. It's actually a pretty unique space in there because it's a multi-story vaulted ceiling, uh, all exposed uh, steel trusses. And we have just some perspectives here. Again, this is from sunny side, sort of a bird's eye view here. And then this is from the rear showing this new ramp down um, to the lower level. And again, you know, we're, we're showing sort of in these images, sparse plantings, but I know um, the members of Column Health that are on the phone call, uh, on, the, on the Zoom rather, if you go to their uh, office on 339, they're very much into landscaping. They've done a beautiful job at that facility. And I think uh, it's safe to say that this will be treated in a similar fashion with drought resistant uh, native plants that will um, really uh, revitalize a lot that has been somewhat blighted for for years now so with that i'll i'll return it back to mr nessie um i uh just want to say that uh, column health really does need this extra space uh they're bulging at the seams at the 339 mass and property and uh when this property came on the market they might have uh, wanted to acquire it for a different purpose but uh, as time went along it occurred to both uh, Jim and Colin that this would be the ideal location uh, uh, for them to have their office, uh, their uh, expanded office space, their expanded conference space. Uh, it's within a five minute uh, driving distance from 339 Mass Ave, and it's compatible uh, with the use of the property at 339 Mass Ave uh, as well. And with that, uh, I turn it over to the board. Thank you, Mr. Anessi. Thank you, Mr. Chalfant, as well, for your uh, you walk through the project. Um, I have a couple of quick questions, and then I will turn it over to the board for additional questions. Um, so I saw you have added additional bike parking. Um, I'm curious how a bike gets to the interior bike parking. Sure. So uh, there's really a few methods. Uh, one, we've got these two operable garage doors here, which are intended to be not on a day like today where we're all passing out from the heat, but I think on occasion have those doors rolled up uh, sort of to engage the activate the sidewalk. They could come in that way or they could come in through the side here. And again, as I mentioned, the whole um, floor is a, is a slab. So we're not really concerned about getting like a carpet dirty or anything. And I think okay. More than likely, this storage space in the rear is going to be utilized for overnight situations rather than day to day. I imagine those will stay in the rear of the building. Okay, thank you. Um, and that is the it is which, which is which door would you sort of consider be, to be the main entrance? Is it coming in off the street or is it coming in off the parking? Well, I, I would say. Um, the, the public entrance would still be along Sunnyside here. Okay. Uh, the majority of people utilizing the space, though, would be accessing it off the uh, parking lot here over here and taking this pathway in the back door. Okay. And are both of, with both of those entrance, I know that like right now there's a slope going from the street up to the garage doors. So I'm curious if the, if both entrances would be accessible or whether just the rear one would be accessible and the front would not. So our, our intention would be to make both of them accessible. Uh, I, the rear one would absolutely, I think the front one as it currently uh, resides, we would need to do some reworking with possibly that sidewalk or looking at recessing that door slightly to get okay. the slopes to meet ADA. But um, the intention would be for all access points to be accessible. Very good. Um, and then the, the other thing that was pointed out on the, um, the, the planning department memo, which you obviously know is the, the exterior signage is actually not something we have jurisdiction over that would have to go back before the ARB for approval. Correct. We do know yep. that. Yes. Yep. yep. We, we yep. intend to do that as well. Yeah. Yep. Uh, not the ARB necessarily, uh, uh, Chris. We right. uh, apply to the building inspector initially. It then gets referred to the planning department. 
they look at it okay yep. they then make a determination as to whether it goes further at that point so it could very stop at the planning department stage as well very true those were my only questions other questions from the board mr revelak i've got um one and perhaps a, a follow-up so the plan showed a basement area and i'm curious as to how much of that basement area is underground? All of it. All of it. So the reason I'm asking is our bylaw distinguishes between uh, basements and cellars. Um, so if this is completely below ground, this would meet the definition of a cellar. And the reason I'm, I bring this up is the section of our bylaw that covers uh, gross floor area regulations. It's 53, oh, 5322. Uh, it's got a section, subsection 5322A, which lists the things that are included in gross floor area. And one of the, one of those items, it's 5322A6, is sellers in residential uses. And I read that as kind of an implication that sellers in commercial uses um, that space is not counted towards GFA. Uh, first, I and this has obvious impacts for open space requirements, auto parking, and bicycle parking. But I'd like to check with members of the board and um, and members of inspectional services if that interpretation is in fact correct. I believe that oh, really? is correct, but yes, check. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I seem to remember that that we actually have had that case somewhere up in Arlington Heights, maybe last fall, maybe the previous year, and we uh, and we adopted that interpretation. Okay, so just so the applicants are aware, um, you know the the parking requirements in you know both automotive and short term and long term bicycle. Uh, would be, you know, really based on the first floor area of 4,570. Um, you're providing more of all three of those than you need to. And um, I personally have no objections, but, you know, you do, you would have the option to provide less if you so <clears throat> desired. Um, I think that does it for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. Mr. Mills? <clears throat> yes, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm uh, wondering, uh, Column Health, how many uh, personnel do they employ? Yes, Mr. McIntyre. Jim, Jim or Colin, can you respond yes. to that? Yes, ha ha happy to answer that. We have 150 plus uh, employees across 11 sites throughout Massachusetts. Okay, so this would more or less be a regional managerial oh. meeting spot. Now, th this is just going to be for our executive team. So the four folks that are over at 339 now with offices would be primarily the four folks that would be over at Sunnyside. So it just seems like a large area to use just for executive meetings. Um, I noticed they're redoing the ramp into the basement. It's quite a bit of work. Uh, what do you intend to use the basement for? For storage. Of what exactly? May I ask? Because I mean, if you're just going to store, that's a you know, you could have a quick little uh, elevator going down. The ramp seems quite extensive. Uh, well, th there's an existing ramp now, so to regrade the ramp is not as extensive as taking out and putting in an elevator. Mm -hmm. But what kind of materials would you be storing? Just office materials? Uh, correct. We'd be moving a lot of things from 339 that were currently stored over to the Sunnyside location. Are we talking okay. records, uh, medical records, things of that nature? Okay. Just want to make sure uh, it's on the up and up. And um, what assurances do we have this would not be uh, used for any clinical uh, applications? You know, if you ran into an overflow situation because that could get the neighborhood up and agitated a bit. Sure, can appreciate that. We, we, this, this is not a clinic. It, it's not gonna be built out as a clinic. It's not designed as a clinic. Um, it, 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 it is not a clinic. 
um, that there there will be no uh, patient accessibility to this site. Uh, question to the chair: How do we control that going forward? So I was going to ask a question, therefore, of Mr. Valarelli, if the if the use of the space as a clinic would be a different use category under the zoning bylaw than the use yes. of an office. Yes. I believe it is, Mr. I, yeah, I would have to I can answer to that, but go ahead, Rick. Uh, I, I'd have to get back to you. I believe it is. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to Bob uh, Anessi as he's done. It is, a, it is a different use, and okay. it's, uh, uh, it, it's under a different portion of the bylaw. And the reason I know that, Rick, is I did the one on Pleasant Street years ago, okay, yeah. uh, under a, a different section of the bylaw. So uh, I think I can say to you, Mr. Mills, that there is no way that th this property is going to be equipped to treat patients down there. And quite frankly, uh, if anybody even tried to do it, I think the building inspector would be on my clients so quickly that uh, it, uh, it, uh, they'd shut, they'd shut the, my client down very quickly. But again, it's a different section of the bylaw. We'd have to apply under a different section of the so bylaw. It was a to, to use it in, it in that fashion would be a zoning violation is essentially the Absolutely. It's a violation of the special permit should it be granted. Absolutely. Well, I'd just like to say it will be uh, quite an aesthetic improvement on the site and we welcome to the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Are there other questions from the board? Seeing none, um, I will go ahead and open public comment. Um, sort of wave the reading of my longer list of things I say before we open public comment. Um, but we currently have uh, two people. If you'd like to speak, um, you can digitally raise your hand by pushing the raise hand in the par under the participants tab. If you're on the phone, which no one is, but you can dial star nine for the phone. Uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street, uh, and uh, a member of the Arlington Tree Committee. Um, I want to applaud the addition of the uh, the open space that will now be landscaped as opposed to open space uh, pavement desert. Um, my first question would be, though, is uh, there an intention to use uh, permeable surfaces for the uh, the parking space? <laughs> Will? So, um, um, if I could respond to that, I, I believe that uh, their intention would be to absolutely make the walkways out of permeable pavers um, and possibly an apron at the entrance. I think the issue, we would have to check with the groundwater to see if we're going to possibly create a runoff problem by doing that, opposed to using a, you know, impervious surface uh, or a pervious one if we want to maintain our water on our site, obviously, as we do. Um, but I, I don't think that would be off the table by any means. Uh, certainly could do the striping out of permeable pavers at the minimum. Um, sometimes there's an issue with pay, with uh, plowing in that, but I, I don't see that as a, a problem. Here. Anything here is obviously a massive improvement, but uh, I don't want to speak for the client. If they're willing to do that, I'm sure that's something they'd, they'd be willing to look at. Thank you. Mr. Moore? Yeah, uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I, I definitely would like to encourage uh, permeability because the current impermeable surface is a, uh, unfortunately is repeated many times over the, uh, the Arlington um, landscape. So this would be a vast improvement that way, just uh, permeability wise. Uh, secondly, I just wanted to bring up uh, in terms of landscaping, uh, I'm glad that you're going to uh, encourage significant landscaping. However, from a tree perspective, which is of my particular interest, I, I would uh, encourage you to you uh, plant large shade trees. I know you said you're already going to work towards uh, using native species, which is excellent. Um, there's a lot of invasive species in, Arl in, in Arlington. However, um, uh, large shade trees are a vastly improvement on um, uh, the use of the landscape space versus uh, decorative smaller trees that are definitely pretty and nice to look at for sure, but, but uh, in terms of uh, shading and uh, sustainability, the large shade trees is a better way to go. And it looks like you've got significant space that can can accept trees here. So that, uh, again, is a, an excellent improvement. So thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, let me start by saying that this is a huge improvement over the previous proposal earlier this year, and I compliment the um, applicants for what they've done here. Um, I do have an observation regarding ADA issues. Uh, there's a single HP space provided in the lot. Uh, federal and state law require that it be sized for a van. That means that the access aisle adjacent to it has to be eight feet wide rather than the five feet shown. Uh, obviously, this is a fairly minor change to be made. Um, the other thing I was going to comment on, but it's already been addressed, is that the current front door is not um, accessible and uh, would have to be brought into compliance, but apparently that's going to be done. Um, I also want to follow up on what Mr. Mills brought up a little earlier. Um, this application provides very little information about the basement storage area. It doesn't say what is being stored. It doesn't provide anything in the nature of the truck traffic delivering these corporate goods and then distributing it to the various satellite clinics run by Column Health. There doesn't seem to be a loading dock in the plans. Um, the driveway access is extremely challenging for any truck attempting to back down this steep slope uh, because it's around a tight curve with very little visibility. And when it arrives at the bottom, there is insufficient level area for the wheelbase of any truck. Uh, so trucks will be end up being parked at a steep angle at the entrance to the um, cellar level. And that's gonna lead me to ask what you might think to be a very strange question, but I do have a good basis for asking it. Will this basement area be used as a garage for either storage or restoration of private automobiles not associated with the business of Column Health? I can, I can say for the record, okay, for everyone to hear very clearly that that is not going to happen. Colin and Jim McIntyre have never been involved in the automobile business in their lives. They wouldn't know how to change a spark plug if in fact that had to happen. Thank you. Uh, okay, the, um, I should explain myself for asking such a strange question. And uh, the members of the board might remember that not too long ago, um, 339 Mass Ave, was up before this board regarding the building of a very large garage structure um, behind the um, Column Health headquarters. And um, the building permit for this structure, which you can see in my background there, um, was to provide public parking for the headquarters building. Um, and what I understand from neighbors of the area is that it instead is being used for some sort of private automotive repair on a interesting range of vehicles. I'm going to object to this. Cars. Well, I'm going to Can object to this, this, both on relevance, okay, on, and hearsay, Chairman, okay? I'm Mr. So, Hanlon would understand that. Neighbors one second, Mr. something one second, to Mr. Seltzer. Mr. Chairman, may I complete what I have to say and, and then have Mr. Anessi reply? That, that's what I'm trying to do. My connection is unstable. Mr. Ness, if you could hold on for one minute, please let Mr. I will. Seltzer complete, I will. and then we'll come to you immediately. You. Mr. Thank Seltzer? You. Okay, in any case, um, the garage that was built there, um, um, it has been reported that there are a number of vehicles being worked on that there are actually automotive lifts in it. Um, there are vehicles such as um, this old unregistered truck that has been parked in the front driveway there. And to all appearances, it's being used not at all for public parking for the building, but instead is being used for these other uses. Um, and I welcome any explanation of why this is so. And that's why I raised the question about whether the Sunnyside um, Avenue 
building would be used in a similar way for storage of vehicles in the cellar. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Mr. Nessie, if you could respond, please. No storage of vehicles in the basement at a sun the Sunnyside property, not going to happen, okay? Yeah, if Never I, even was on the horizon. And, and, and if, if, I, if I could add, the, uh, it is not used as a distribution center for our other clinics. Sort of all we, you know, we're outpatient mental health. We don't have a lot of disposable goods. All the goods are delivered directly to the clinics. The, the basement is truly for office storage. They're not going to be significant uh, repeated deliveries to the basement of materials that would necessitate some of the uh, comments we made. Thank you for answering my questions. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Um, just to go back briefly on what, on the, to the first point Mr. Seltzer had raised um, in regards to the ramp, just making sure that that curved ramp is going to be, it's going to sort of meet your needs in terms of access to the basement because really it's it's either that it appears it's either that or it's that radius stair coming down from the first floor so the ramp itself is a 12 percent slope it's got a seven and a half percent depression on the last seven feet of the ramp which avoids the need for bottoming out i appreciate the attention to the detail i've done a 60 unit project in, in cambridge which has a sharper ramp mm -hmm. this is more than adequate for the rare use that it will get and uh, I really think it's a non-issue, but I appreciate the concern. Are there any concerns in regards to uh, to water coming down the ramp? Uh, there would be a trench drain at the base of the ramp that would tie into a Coltec chamber, which would service the site. Okay, perfect, thank you. Other questions from the board? Mr. Revelak. Oh, Steve, you are muted. My apologies, Mr. Chair. This this is just an out of curiosity question. <laughs> Given that, um, so the, um, this by way of background, I happen to live on Sunnyside Avenue. Um, prior to the, and you know, as someone who goes by the, the area frequently, I, I, I'm, I agree with the sentiments expressed earlier that this would be a huge improvement over present conditions. Now, prior to um, you know the current state of the, the the property, it was an auto repair shop, and prior to that, it was a body shop. It, this might this is just a, a silly question, maybe for Mr. Valorelli, but even if the owners were to do auto repair in the basement, you know, there's technically is that use already allowed for this property? Mr. Redlock, I'm I'm not sure of that, but they're asking the board for something totally different. Yeah. Okay. You're, You're right. Specific on what they're granting. Mm -hmm. They're asking for a change of use yes. from the automotive use to an office use. Okay. So therefore, we couldn't do that. We'd be in violation of the special permit. Okay. Very good. Um, personally, I like I said, I live down the street, and I I think this is a nice project. Um, and uh, yes, I I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot to ask if there are any further public comments. Um, there were no hands raised, but I just wanted to give one last opportunity in case there was somebody from the public who wished to comment. Um, seeing none, I will go ahead then and formally close public comment. And then anything further from the members of the board? Seeing none, um, so the board has the, the, the three typical um, conditions that we apply that we read at the prior hearing, so I'll waive reading them now. Um, should the board vote to approve, are there any additional conditions that the board would want to impose? I am seeing none. With that in mind, may I have a motion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the board approve the application <clears throat> of 10 Sunnyside before us with uh, the three standard conditions that the chair previously referred to. 
Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. A uh, roll call vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. In the absence of Mr. O'Rourke, uh, Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So the motion is approved. So the board will put together a formal written decision that we will vote on it. And upcoming hearing and then you are free and clear but thank you very much thank you very much gentlemen great thank, thank you very you much you should have good night everyone uh, mr chilpon before you come off i just want to make sure mr Vallarelli, can you make sure we don't get closed off yeah we're still good to go mr chairman perfect thank you all right everyone thank you very much um moving on then to the business portion of the meeting uh, we have three administrative actions to take this evening. There are uh, meeting minutes from the March 23rd, the April 27th, and the May 11th um, meetings that were all circulated to the board. Um, I hope everyone has had a chance to read them and submit comments. Um, are there any additional comments to submit on those minutes at this time? Seeing none, and I will go ahead. We had slightly different attendances at the different meetings, so I will go ahead and um, I just do a quick roll call vote uh, differently for each one. Um, so I move approval of the minutes for March 23rd. Second. I have a second. Second. Pat. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, so, roll call vote. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those meetings are, those minutes are approved. I move approval of the minutes of April 27th, 2021. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Roll call vote of those present. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Mr. O'Rourke will be in absentia. Um, and then motion to approve, I move to approve the minutes of May 11th, 2021. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, vote, uh, a roll call vote. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Aye. Mills? Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those minutes are, meeting minutes are approved. Okay, and the last thing before we depart for the evening. Um, so our upcoming schedule, just to make sure everyone's aware. So the next hearing we have scheduled is for Tuesday, July 13th um, at 7.30 p.m., which is a continuance of Thorndike Place. Um, and then currently Friday, July 16th is the scheduled close of the public hearing on Thorndike Place, and that is something I believe we will be discussing. Um, and then Thursday, July, this makes no sense. I have Thursday, July 19th, but that is July 19th. I, I thought it was it's Monday, July 19th. Right, me too. What did I mean to put down the Monday, July 19th. Um, I believe that's our date for the continuance of 1165R Massachusetts Avenue. Does that mm -hmm. sound right to everybody? It is. Uh, I, I, I recall it was uh, an unusual choice of nights to accommodate okay. schedules. Ah, okay. That could be, yeah, because I believe we were having trouble scheduling Paul for that one. Mm -hmm. yep, yeah, Monday, July 19th. Yep. Okay. And then that one is scheduled, so, and then 1165R Mass Ave is scheduled to close Friday, July 23rd. Um, and we will obviously review that at the meeting on the 19th. Um, Mr. Valarelli, are there any other dates upcoming? 
We have no uh, firm dates as of yet, Mr. Chairman. However, we do have some um, packages that are coming our way, but I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't anticipate that until September sometime. Okay. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Very I'm good. You. I'm with you, Roger. <laughs> yeah, right. it, um, a breather. <laughs> <laughs> a breather of sorts. For sure. Well, thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially wish to thank Rick Valorelli and Vincent Lee for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting tonight's online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It is our understanding that the recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Mr. Hanlon. A second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Quick roll call of the board. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Aye. Mr. Mills. Mr. Revelak. Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Take care, John. Uh, Take care, everybody. everybody. Pat, quick question for you. Yeah. Um, in regards to uh, writing the decisions on these, Yeah. Um, do you want me to start on them? I know you had said because you, you were away, you weren't sure you'd be able to get on to them. I'm going to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll be back on the, uh, I'm flying back on the 5th. So that, that should be enough time for me to get them done by the 13th, okay. which is what I'd aim at. Oh, perfect. Okay. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you Pat. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.